Uh, I'm showing exactly 120, so I'm going to start. Are you guys ready with AV? All right. Stuart, are you going to lock the door in the back so nobody can get out? Okay, good. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone, to the Python 3 metaprogramming tutorial. A uh, quick question. How many of you are, you, are, you, are using Python 3? Uh, yeah, the number's going up. Okay, we're up to like 10% uh, of the room now. Okay. Um, What's this tutorial about? Um, first of all, this, pi this tutorial is Python 3.3 or newer. If you're using anything else, you're living in the past. It's dead to me. I'm not talking about that. Okay? Um, there are some support files if you go to the website. Uh, you are not going to need those for this tutorial unless you want to try and follow along. This is going to go pretty fast. So unless you're like a super fast typist or you know, any, anything like that. Uh, it, it's, it's not the kind of thing where I'm just going to have you do a bunch of hands-on work. It's going to be more live coding and some other, other things. Uh, basically, the gist of this tutorial, two advanced topics, Python 3, metaprogramming. Can you have too much of either? Answer is no, as you will see. Um, if you're new to metaprogramming, it's in a nutshell, it's basically code that manipulates code. It's things like decorators, it's meta classes, descriptors, things like that. If, you, if you've ever seen this stuff before, um, or heard about it, it's, it's manipulating code in your program. And why you would care about this is this is basically the magic that a lot of, uh, I would say, advanced frameworks and libraries use. Uh, you know, it, it, they, they use a lot of this stuff to do interesting things. If you understand it, you, you actually get a much deeper understanding of how Python works uh, generally. I think it's sort of fun and evil in a sort of, you know, fun, you know interesting way. Um, and it actually solves sort of a practical problem, which is that, basically dry, which is don't repeat yourself. As, as I'm illustrating here, not repeating yourself. Um, basically, um, highly rep repetitive code really sucks. Uh, it's, it, it, it seems like if you have code where you're like constantly cutting and pasting and things, it gets really tedious to write. It's hard to read. It basically, what, what ends up happening is it just motivates people to write tools to automate the process. And then the tool becomes this like own monster of its, uh, <laughs> of itself. So, so right, repetitive code, sort of not, not very fun. And that's actually what a lot of metaprogramming gets into, sort of automating you know, repetitive tasks. So what we're going to try to do in the tutorial is kind of a modern journey of some of this metaprogramming stuff. Um, if you haven't done much, much with Python 3, it seems like everybody focuses on Python 3. They're talking about, oh, Unicode. It's like, oh, yeah, OK. You know, Uni First of all, there's not going to be any Unicode in this tutorial. Okay, so, um, and, and, and honestly, I think Unicode is probably the least interesting part of Python 3. I mean, it's, yeah, it's there, but it's just sort of boring. I mean, nobody cares about that. I mean, OK, so um, the, the really interesting part of Python 3 is more actually in sort of the language itself, some of the metaprogramming features, some of the advanced stuff. So I'm going to try to get into that. Um, I'd say the target audience of this talk is basically framework library builders or just anyone who wants to understand how that stuff works. I think it's kind of fun to look at how it works. Uh, as far as some reading, a little shameless self-promotion, uh, the contents of this are sort of loosely based on things in the Python cookbook, third edition. This is the mythical third edition of the cookbook, which actually is in physical form fully written at this time. It's basically going to uh, press in May. so. Right now, it's in copy edit. If you want to take a look at this, by the way, I'm going to have it kind of floating around the conference and stuff. So uh, that, that's actually coming out. And one little caution, if you, if you do everything in this class or tutorial all at once, you'll either be fired or have permanent job security. <laughs> uh, that's all I'm going to say. It's a fine line uh, between the two, as you will, you will see. Um, and so let's just do some preliminaries. Oh, uh, one other thing. Um, the whole tutorial, I don't know whether you can see that very well, has, has sort of a theme related to a, the movie Apocalypse Now, which is uh, one of my uh, favorite movies, actually. You know, it's a sort of you know, the, the journey up the river, and it gets more and more insane the further it goes. So it's going it's to kind of have that, that theme to it here. So, so let's do some preliminaries. Um, there's some stuff that you should know up front. And I'll, I'll apologize if this is going to go way fast, but I have to go through this pretty fast to get to the interesting stuff. As you know, code is, is basically built out of some basic blocks. Statements, functions, classes. And statements obviously do the work of your program. Um, you can execute statements uh, using the exec function, which uh, we'll see later, but it ba basically statements execute your program. Uh, functions are probably the unit of most code in your, in your program. You write functions and modules, you make methods of classes, and so forth. Just a, a bunch of statements with a, with a name attached to it. 
Uh, with functions, you should know about there's, that there's uh, two different calling conventions. You should know about positional arguments and you should know keyword arguments. You should also know that you can have default arguments. Hopefully you know that defaults are set once at definition time and generally it's a bad idea to use mutable values for that. That's, I, don't, I don't really want to get into that, but generally you don't want to use things like lists and dictionaries as default. You should also know about star on star args, uh, star args, star star args. Uh, this is basically a way of collecting positional and keyword arguments into a function. Basically call a function, all the things passed by position go into args. Everything by keyword goes into keyword args. And you should also know that you can uh, pass tuples and dictionaries doing similar convention. So if you have like a tuple, you can pass that as arguments using the star. Same thing for a dictionary. Uh, one Python 3 thing uh, that we're gonna use a little bit is uh, Python, uh, Python 3 has this keyword only argument style. This is, this is not available in 2, but if you write a function and you put a star and then you name more parameters after the star, it turns out that you can only pass those in as keywords. There's some interesting techniques that you can do with those, by the way. Like um, one of the things you can do is add keyword arguments to functions that take any number of positional arguments. There's some, you know, I I interesting sort of techniques there. Uh, another thing that I hope you've seen is the concept of a closure. If you have not seen that, basically the gist of it is you can write a function that makes a new function. Code generator. Think of it as a code generator. So you can say, oh, like make adder. Here's define a function return it back. That thing that returns back is something that will execute the code. You're like making code. We're gonna use that a fair amount. And then you should know some things about classes, basically simple class definitions. Uh, just some, some terminology here. Uh, if you have a class, any kind of variable that's defined at the class level is something known as a class variable. Any variable that's defined in the init function is an instance variable, and any kind of method on there is an instance method. A little bit of terminology. And you might also uh, want to know about some of the other method types as well. Um, there are basically class methods that uh, are executed on the class. Just a little bit of subtlety here. Uh, an instance method, you execute that on an instance. Class method, you execute it on the class. Static method is just a function put in a class, basically. Okay, so those are, those are some things that, that you should know. Also, um, special methods. You can customize almost every part of Python using some kind of special method like get item or get attribute uh, and, and so forth. And then inheritance with classes. You can take, basically take a class, inherit from it, and then customize it. Make some changes to it. And then last but not least, um, I, I hope that you know that the Python object system is layered heavily on top of dictionaries. Okay, so um, when you make uh, an instance, that's, that's essentially a dictionary sitting underneath the covers, and you're manipulating that. So uh, that is the basics that I hope you know coming in here. Um, if, if not, I'll just have to apologize uh, for what's gonna come. So the, um, the, the, the first thing that we're gonna do here is I wanna illustrate some basic metaprogramming concepts with something that is very, very easy before we get into like the really insane part of it later on. So the thing that I'm gonna look at first is just the problem of debugging, mainly because it's really simple. So um, if you wanna do debugging, the only proper way to do it is with the print statement, okay? That's what I'm just gonna say that up front. You have to use the print statement. That's the only one and true way to debug. So you have a function, put a print statement in there. Works great, you know, you just run, you don't have to recompile or anything, just run it, get print. Um, the problem with that is um, it gets kind of repetitive after a while. I mean, if you're really having a problem, you're gonna start getting a lot of print statements on functions and, and so forth. So you see something like that and it's like, ah, you know, okay, socks. Okay, so what have, we, what have we got here? We have code repetition, repetitive code, repeating myself here. This is um, basically where you start to introduce decorators. Or it's one place where decorator function might come up. It's basically what a decorator is. It's, it's a, a wrapper around an existing function. And generally what you're gonna do is just take that original function and, and, and put like some extra code around it. So, so this, is, this is the kind of thing that you would do. Let's just do a little live demo here. So uh, I'm gonna make a, a first, first, first of all, all metaprogramming, by the way, needs to be done in Emacs. It works better <laughs> in Emacs. So, um, yeah. Well, you know, it, it help, it's because of the lisp. It, need, it likes to be, it's, like, it's sort of like uh, homeopathy, right? It, it, it picks up, 
it picks up the, 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 the meta programming from the Lisp, even though we're not doing, you know. Let, let's not go there. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to make uh, just a file here. I'm going to call it uh, debugly. Everything in here is going to be have an L after it because that's, you know, the thing to do these days. So uh, basically what a, what, a, what a decorator might be is it's a, basically a function that takes a function as input. Okay, so funct is like your, your input function. Well, <laughs> what the hell does that? Okay, I, okay. okay. <laughs> can't even write a comment. Okay, so that's, that's going uh, to be wrapped. And then what you do is you just define a wrapper that typically takes all arguments like this. You're going to put, you're gonna put your print statement in there like, I don't know, print. Uh, Python 3. Oh, Python 3, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that print thing has got me so screwed up, man. It's like, oh, so, so first of all, like when I first started doing Python 3, I started doing printf everywhere. I'd have like, <laughs> no, it's, it's true. I would write these programs and I'd go in there and run it like 40 occurrences of printf coming from like, because I used to do a lot of C programming and it's just, I don't know. So, okay, that, that's neither. Okay, print, print func name. Um, and then you just return the, return the function. Okay, so you would, you would do something like this. Basically, you're making code here, okay? So you, you're generating a wrapper, you're returning it back. And then what you would do if you wanted to apply that in your code is you would just say, okay, you know, from debugly, import debug. And then you would just apply it to your functions. Okay, so some, something like that. Um, so, so if that worked, which uh, I don't know, we'll find out if it, if it did here, I should just be able to, um, you know, import that example code do an add, you know, two, three, and then it, okay, print out the add message there. Okay, kind of, kind of lame there. But that's, that's sort of the idea with a decorator. Basically taking like an existing function, you're going to wrap some stuff around it. Um, now, there are some technicalities with decorators that are a little bit unfortunate. Um, one of the things that's, that's a little bit nasty about them, and you may know this already, is that um, they tend to uh, lose a lot of their information. Like they lose their name. Like here it comes up and just says function wrapper, you know, it's like, yeah, okay. And the other, the other thing is it tends to lose like help information. Like if you do a help on it, it just sort of, you know, wrap, it's like what in the world is that all about? So um, one, one technicality with some of these decorators is that you have to do some other things. Um, to, to really write them properly, you have to import this wraps feature from funct tools and then apply that as a decorator to funct. Okay, so you have to use decorators like in the implementation of a decorator. It turns out that what that does is it copies metadata from one function to the other. It changes the name, it copies documentation strings, does, does some other things. So, so that, that's kind of like a basic decorator. Um, you can, you, you can do that. Oh, actually, one, one note, um, I didn't do this in the example, but, the, but functions in Python 3 actually have this new attribute qual name that you can use instead of underscore name. It's like actually the fully qualified function name with like the, the dot of where it's located and so forth. So, um, so, so actually, let's see what happens if we change that. If you notice here, it, uh, it sort of did a, uh, it just printed out add. So let's, uh, let's try that again here. Well, it still printed out add. Um, that qual name thing will actually come into play if you start using it with uh, classes and stuff. It'll actually print out like the class name along with the, along with the method. So, so that's, that's some simple, simple decorator stuff. I'm actually kind of hoping that you've seen simple decorators before coming in here. So. Yeah, the qual name, yeah, questions about the qual name. I think it, it uses the, like, it will start with the class name and then give you the dotted, dotted thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, so, so that's, a, that's a basic decorator. Now, yeah, and, and, and I mentioned if you don't use that wraps thing, weird things happen. So generally, generally want to use that. And then, okay, so slides kind of go through this, this demo that I just did here. Big picture. Um, one feature about using a decorator is that you actually isolate the debugging code to a single location. I mean, this is actually one of the benefits of doing this decoration stuff, is that you can just apply that decorator, a whole bunch of things, and you don't actually have to care about the implementation details of the decorator. I mean, this is the, the benefit of it, is you just use it, 
And then if you want to, you can actually mess around with the implementation of that debug. There's all sorts of things that you could do in there. You could change it to use the logging module if you wanted to. Okay, so there's a, a variant there where it's, it, it's just like, oh, okay, you know, let's, let's use logging and send data out to logging module. You could do things like have like optionally disable the debugging. I don't know, maybe through an environment variable or some other, other thing. Um, key idea though, is that you can change the decorator independently of the code that's using it. Do all sorts of different things. Very, very kind of cool. Now, now some, some variations of this. Let's go back to the, de, the debugging with print. Um, it turns out if you debug with print, you're not doing it right unless you include some kind of magic prefix on the author. Okay, so, you know, like, like triple star or plus, 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 or one or bracket or something, because basically you have to grep through the 50 megabytes of output that you get from your program and you have to see your debugging messages. So, so one of the things uh, that you might want to do is have a decorator that takes arguments as input. Like maybe you want to change this so you can say, well, I want to debug it, but I want to pass in like a, like a prefix or something to, to make that work. Um, to do decorators with arguments, it looks a little bit weird um, due to the calling convention that takes place. Um, essentially what happens is you take a decorator, well, it basically calls the function with the arguments, and then it takes the result of that and calls it with the function. You end up with this really sort of bizarre construct here, um, essentially two levels of nested functions. And if you haven't seen this before, here's the, the gist of the idea. Uh, basically, the outer function provides like an environment for use in the inner functions. Okay, so what happens here is this outer function takes like an input value prefix, and then that variable is just available inside that whole block of code. It's just sort of saying, okay, here's this argument. And then, and then what you can do inside is you just write a normal decorator function, except that you can refer to that variable that got passed in. It looks a little bit, it looks a little bit funky if you, if you haven't seen that before, but it's basically just this outer function that, that, that passes that in. Um, there's an interesting reformulation of that that I sometimes will do. Um, see if this makes any sense here. Um, some, sometimes I, I'll, I'll start, maybe I'll do this as a demo. Um, it turns out that, that adding, that if you want to add an argument to a decorator, it becomes sort of weird because you, you, know, you, you, have, the, you have the prefix that you're going to pass in, but then you end up having to write sort of the same code that you had before. Th this is what you would have to do normally. It's like you would, you would sort of start writing the code like this, and, 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 and it's like, okay, this is... I'm getting code repetition inside my decorator, which is supposed to eliminate code repetition, right? It's like it's messing with my brain that I'm repe like repeating code here. So you can actually do some, some little tricks here. I mean, one, one trick that you can do is, is play some games with um, optional arguments. Like this, this, let's see if you can figure this one out. Okay, so I'm going to make a, a function where everything is optional. The function is none, prefix is that. And then uh, I'm going to check if the function is none. It means that it wasn't passed, okay? And I'm going I'm to do this sort of hack like that. Um, you're like, good God, what in the world is that about? Um, so, so, so the idea here is that if the function was none, this thing calls itself again and returns it, or it uses this partial function to sort of return like a, like a callable that will invoke itself again with the data. Um, the way that that's supposed to work is you would go into your example code, like, actually, let me use the prefix here. Okay, so I'm going to make a message and use that. The way that that would actually be used in your code is really like this. You could either use it as debug, in which case it would work normally, or you could come in here and specify a prefix. You just say, oh, the prefix is star, star, star. It's kind of like a decorator that works either with an argument or without an argument. If it works correctly, which I don't know whether it will, but we'll, we'll find out. Um, okay, there's the add. There's the star, okay, the, the sub there. It's basically taking that as an optional argument. And again, you probably, uh, 
You maybe have seen that before if, you, if you've done decorators before, but it's a, you know, sort of an optional, optional version of that. So, so that's how that's, that's, that's going be, to gonna be used. Now, just to move on from, from that, here, here's, here's sort of the next level of some of this decorator stuff. Um, let's say you wanted to debug all the methods of a class. Okay, you have a class and you're like, I want to apply a decorator to all the methods. One of the things that somebody might ask is, can you just automate that to do all the methods at once? Um, this sort of takes you into the, basically the area of a, what's known as a class decorator. Turns out you can apply a decorator to a class definition and use, do something like this. You can basically say, hey, I want to debug all the methods of this class and I'm just going to walk through the class body and apply decorators. Now, how that actually works, let's do a little, little demo of that. Um, what, you can, what you can do here is you can say, okay, I want to write a function where you can say debug methods where you're going to hand me a class definition. Okay, so CLS is a, is a class. And what I'm going to do is walk through the, basically the dictionary of that class. Okay, so what, what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to say, okay, walk through key value VARs, by the way, will give you the, the class dictionary. So I'm just going to walk through the, uh, the class dictionary there, saying, okay, well, let's just see everything that you have in there. And then if the, uh, if the value part of that happens to be callable, I'm just going to rewrite the class. So I'm just going to set adder on the class key uh, debug of, of val. That's what that's doing. It's basically walking through the class and then it's like doing brain surgery on it. It's probably a really bad idea, but that's, uh, that, that's what's happening there. So you have, this, you have this function, sort of walking through the class definition, putting a decorator around everything, returning the class back. Um, if, if you've done that right, you should be able to write a sort of a class definition like, like this. You could say at you know, debug methods, class span, I'm just going to put uh, you know few few methods on there, like like that. Uh, I also need to uh, change the import to do that. So. Okay, so so if so if you do that, you should be able to make like a like a spam object. Oh, import. Ah, okay. Trying to go fast here. Okay, so there you see basically it comes out and says spam dot, spam dot a. That's actually the um, effect of that uh, qual name, by the way, is that you get the full class name and the name of the function in there. Okay, so this, th this is sort of taking it to the next level. Basically, you can say, okay, uh, I've got debug methods, you know, takes a whole class definition, just decorates the whole thing. Okay, so kind of build, building up some, some concepts here. Sample, sample use of that. Uh, there are some limitations of that that I'm not going to get into right now. It does not work with class methods and static methods. So I'll leave that as an exercise for the reader to figure out why. So it's um, some, some advanced stuff there. But then, um, and then, oh, then there's, what? Does it work with other decorated methods? Uh, it probably would work with other decorators, just not, not those. It might work with those if you did it in the right order. Well, actually, no, I don't know. No, it's not going to work with those, period, in the way that we've got it set up. Yeah, it would probably do it. You, you could experiment with that. Right. Like, you know, which gets decorated first. Yeah, you, you could do something like, um, like, let's say you had something like this. Yeah. It probably would work with that. I mean, what would, hen what would end up happening is you'd get double output. Yeah, what, what order? That's a good question, actually. Um, yeah, I think the, like, the, the class method would come first because that was the outermost wrapping, and then the other one would come, come next there. Yeah, the methods get, would, de would get defined first. Yeah, and then the class decorator will come in after the fact. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you can you can you can do that again. Moving moving pretty fast here, but we'll, you'll see why in a second here. Okay. So, um, oh, some other some other interesting stuff with uh, class decorators, by the way. I mean, this is sort of a sneaky thing too. Um, 
Class decorators are actually cool because you can do all sorts of horrible like brain surgery on classes. Uh, this, is, uh, this, this is actually kind of an interesting one um, that is debugging attribute access. And the concept here, I'll sort of just talk through it, is that you give it a class and it reaches into the class and just yanks off the get attribute method. If you don't know what get attribute is, it's, it's the method that does attribute lookup. So you're just reaching in, you're like yanking it off. Uh, and then what you're doing is you're writing a replacement for it that has a print statement, and then it calls the original. That's what's going on here. It's sort of saying, well, okay, just put it on. Then, then call the original version. And then what you can do is just drop this new version on the class. You can just say, ah, oh, here you go. Here's your new get attribute method. Return it back. Um, what would happen with that is if you put, it in front, put this in front of a class, all of a sudden you'd start getting messages for all the attribute lookup. You've done some sort of evil you know, patching or hacking of, the, hacking of the code there. So there, there's a variety of sort of interesting, interesting things you can do with that. And then kind of the, the final frontier here, what if you wanted to debug all the classes? I mean, I don't, I maybe, maybe, I, I don't know, at this point you might just say, well, you can't pro, you don't know how to program if you're doing this, right? You gotta, you gotta put a print statement on every method of every class in like some hierarchy or something like that. Um, again, you get back to this repetitive code business if you want to solve that, the obvious solution is to define a meta class. Okay, so um, you're like, what in the world? I'm going to talk about this in a second, but what? Yeah, what value? It's obviously a meta class. Um, let me talk about this for a second. Well, let me tell you what this does, and I'll, I'll get into the details in a second here. Um, the idea here is that this basically creates a class normally, and then it comes in and applies a class decorator to it. So what it's doing is it's saying, okay, make a class, now automatically wrap it, return it back. Okay, so a little bit of a head explosion with that. Um, if, you are not, if you have not done anything with meta classes before, here's the gist of the idea. Every single value in Python has a type. Hopefully this is something that you know by now, but like an integer has type int and a string has type stir, and a list has type list, and so forth. Everything has a type. There's a type system. It's in the language. Um, every type in Python is defined by a class. Okay, so there's a class for ints and a class for, for lists, and if you make your own class spam, and you make an instance of that, and you ask, what's the type of that? Python will say, it's, oh, it's a spam. Okay, the type of it is a spam. So classes are defining types. Very important part of the, part of the system. Now, here is um, where um, things get a little bit weird. Um, actually, I have a little bit of a typo in the slide here. I'm actually noticing this. Um, basically, the, the types of classes are all instances of types. Now, here's the, here's, here's the typo. Let me, let me just fix the typo. This should actually be coming back telling me that it's a type. Okay. Not enough coffee when I prepared this, apparently. Okay. So... Um, it turns out that if, that if you do this, everything will come back as, and tell you that it's a type. Like the type of int, oh, that's a type. The type of list is a type. The type of spam is a type. Everything is a type. And the really, I mean, you have to think about this. Like, okay, classes are instances of types. Instances of types. Okay, well, if it's an instance of a type, then type must be a class somewhere because... That's what classes make instances. And it turns out that there is a, t a class type. And what does, a, what does a class type make? It makes instances of types, just like a class spam makes instances of spam, or class int makes instances of ints. So there is this, this type object that makes instances of types. And it turns out that this is what makes classes in Python. So let's say you had a class. Class, uh, you know, class spam base init bar, something like that. If I were to ask you to deconstruct this thing, you know, it's like, what is that? Well, it has a name, which is spam, and it has a, has a base class, which is base, and it has two functions that are in there, init and bar. It turns out that if you take all those components, uh, this, is, this is sort of what happens when you define a class. It turns out that class definition, ba basically the, the execution model is that the body of the class gets isolated, okay? So the, the statements that are in the class get, kind of get pulled off, isolated. And then what happens is the interpreter will go off and make a dictionary 
that serves as the class namespace. Now, this is actually something very new that we're going to come back to later, but to do this, there's a method on type called underscore prepare that makes the class definition. Basically, it goes to that and says, okay, make the class, di make the class dictionary. Okay, so usually it's just a, usually a dictionary. Then what's going to happen is the body of the class just gets executed in that dictionary. Just, it's basically just run all the statements in the class, in the dictionary. And what will happen is that dictionary will just get populated by doing that. It'll get populated with all the methods. And then you just sort of throw this thing to the type uh, class. You say, hey, go make a type. There's the type, it's spam, base, there's the dictionary. And then voila, you have a class. You get a class definition out of, out of that. So the, the, essentially this type is, is making a class. And here's the sort of the idea on, on the meta class stuff. What if you wanted to use something other than type? Like you want to you make a totally different kind of type at that last step. Turns out that you can specify this when you do a, a class definition by just saying, hey, the meta class of this thing is type or something else. Turns out that whatever you put here is what is going to get used to make the, the type when you're, when you're done with it. So one of the things that you can do is start making your own sort of customized types, if you will. I mean, you, what, you, what you can do is, is, is you, you could do something, well, here, here's sort of a whimsical example. We'll, just, we'll do it interactively. You could say, okay, I'm gonna make my type inherit from type, and then I'm gonna put this new method on here. Basically what you get as input is the class name, the bases, and the class dictionary. And what happens is you're just presented with all this information. You're just saying, okay, here's a class that's being made with class name, bases, and dictionary. You can do anything you want in there. Like one of the things that you could do is you could say, well, if the number of base classes is greater than one, you know, raise type error, you know, no, or something. <laughs> okay, so, um, so you, could, you, could, you could do something, you know, do something like that. Um, uh, yeah, okay, new. Uh, I'm hoping that this will work here. Okay, so, so um, oh, one, one other thing about Python 3, by the way, you don't need to su supply arguments to the super function anymore. So that's, I use that a lot. So, so what would happen there is you could just say, well, okay, okay, here's some class base, you know, meta class is equal to my type. And okay, you know, you're, you've made a class. Um, if you started using this, like let's make a bunch of classes here. It turns out that that code, if I've done this right, is actually working behind the scenes. And if I were to make a class that, that, that inherited from like two different classes here, let's see what happens. Type error, no, okay. <laughs> Basically it's being processed by that, by that code. And the way that that's working is it's, you, you've sort of made like a custom kind of class object. This is, this is kind of the idea in some of this meta class stuff. Yeah. The question is, do meta classes have to inherit from type? Um, you know, honestly, I don't know for certain, but I've never had one work without it. So I, 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 would, say, I, I would say probably yes, like a 95% sort of qualified yes. But, but you, you, you def definitely will, you'll, you'll generally do something like that. And really the key thing with a meta class is that you just get all of this information about the class. You can inspect it, you can modify it. It's kind of like a class decorator. And in fact, many of the problems that you could do with a meta class, you could do with a class decorator. So, which actually raises the question of why would you do this instead of using a decorator, but. So since type runs the eval on the code, or the exact code in the body, then you use something else, like a C compiler. Would Python, does Python actually like the life stack or no? Yeah, the question is, I guess, about code in the class body. I mean, I know Python will execute any statement whatsoever you put in a class body. Right. Like if you put print statements or anything, it'll, it literally yeah. runs the class body just like a script. So. Even, but with the meta class? Yep. So it does that first. It, it does that first, and then, yeah. Then, okay. Yep. So you can't Yeah, basically, yeah, the question about the execution of the body, I mean, it just literally executes that. Whatever's in there, yeah. Regardless. Regardless. Now, uh, now one of the questions that comes up is like, why would you use this meta class stuff? I mean, actually, if, if, if in the in the Python world, meta classes kind of have a 
I don't know whether they have a bad reputation, but they sort of have a reputation of being sort of insane or, uh, you know, the, the Python's killer joke in reference to the, you know, the Monty Python skit where if you hear the joke, you die instantly, you know, sort of thing like that. Um, really, the, probably the, the key thing with meta classes is that they propagate through inheritance. This would be probably the distinguishing feature is that if you um, put a meta class into a class hierarchy, it actually becomes like a genetic mutation on the whole hierarchy of classes. I mean, it goes into the parent, and then it just propagates to all children automatically. And so somebody who's um, sort, of, sort of suitably diabolical or something like that could put, put drop one of these things up in like a, like a base class for some framework, and then it just, it just, it just propagates everywhere in the framework. So, so getting back um, to what I put it in the solution, you, you, we, put, we made a, a meta class debug, you know, debug meta, that what this thing is doing is making a class and then it's slapping a class decorator around it. And it turns out that there's not much code there, but what it's actually doing is making that class decorator propagate through inheritance. That, that's really all that's going on. And it turns out that if you wanted to debug the universe, you just set it once in the base class and then just, it just goes everywhere. Okay, so kind of a big picture on this stuff. A lot of this decorator or metaprogramming stuff, just if, if you were, were gonna think about like sort of a theme here, it's really about wrapping stuff. You know, decorators, you're talking about wrapping functions. Uh, if you're talking about class decorators, you're talking about wrapping classes. If you're talking about meta classes, you're really talking about doing things with class hierarchies. You know, keep in mind that you know, there's a distinct, like a, like a class decorator would be something applied to a single class, where a meta class is like, we're talking about the whole hierarchy of code, changing the DNA of, of how things work. So, a little bit of an interlude here. Let me, let me just pause for a second and see how people are doing before we uh, go into the insane part of the uh, journey here. Question from Mike in the back. Meta class you can get in the new, is it decorator you get the instance of the class or you are later within the class? Oh yeah, 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 one, yeah, one no, so Mike points out it's, it's, it's the, the order in which things happen is different. I mean, with a meta class, you can actually capture things about the class before it ever gets created. Where a class decorator, it's strictly after the fact. Like when you, when you write a class decorator, the class has already been fully formed and you're just looking at it afterwards. So there are, there are some subtle, uh, subtle distinctions there. All right, now, question in the back. When do you all like under under init versus under under new? Yeah, that's because the question is when would you do new versus underscore init? Um, you probably, you might need to do new if you want to change, there, there are certain things that you might have to put into a class dictionary to affect like how the class gets created. Uh, you know, maybe one example of that might be something like the slots attribute. I mean, that would be one example of that. I, mean, I, I don't really talk about slots here, but um, there's certain things that you might have to put in a class definition prior to calling type to get it to, to create properly. Is that what you were going to point out, Mike? Okay, yeah. Mike sort of points out you can, most of the time you can do things with. Okay. Yeah, I, th I think for the most part, probably new and init, almost interchangeable. I, I, I'm sort of in the habit of doing new. Maybe there's no good reason for it, but it's, um, you know, that, that, that you, you can sort of go either way, with, either way with that. All right, so a little bit of an interlude here. Okay. This stuff that we just did, is actually pretty well trodden territory in the Python 2 world, okay? I mean, this, uh, you know, people are doing all of that stuff right now in Python 2. You know, class decorators and meta classes and, and cl you know, and decorators with arguments and all sorts of things like that. I don't think, well, at least I hope not, you didn't come to this tutorial just for me to rehash Python 2 decorator. Okay, so, um, so I want to talk about some other things that are possible, um, some, some more advanced stuff that is Python 3 specific. And to do this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about a problem. We're gonna build something up from this. Um, let's say you had some code with a bunch of data structures. And this is gonna be something really simple. I actually have this code available here. So, so let, me, let me pull it up. Okay, so 
This, call, this is going to be my starting code like that. Um, does anybody sort of find that kind of annoying? Yeah, it's super annoying. I mean, it's like, oh, man, it's, like, it's pretty repetitive. I've actually written code like this myself where I had to like define like 20 different data structures all with sort of slightly different attributes. It's just like, oh, that's really horrible. So um, there's some things you can do with this. Um, one of the things that, that, that you might see, and this is actually a technique used in the standard library, is you can just generalize this a little bit into a, um, like a, with a base class. I mean, this is gonna look like a little bit of a hack, but you can, you can do things like, okay, I'm gonna make like a structure class where you just, you, you define like a list that has the fields. You'll, you'll see how this works in a second here. And then what I'll do is I'll just say, well, for, for name, val, and zip, you know, self, fields, args, set adder, self, uh, name value or something. Okay, so what, th what this is doing is it's kind of, you're trying to write sort of like a generalized init function where you just say, okay, this is, this is gonna set a bunch of values. And then what you would do is you would define all of your classes to inherit from that. That's just a star args right now. But the idea is that you would, um, yeah. Okay, so you, 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 might, you might do something like this. This is, this is actually a trick I've used in Python 2 before to, um, to do this, where you would, you would just say, okay, I'm gonna, oh, actually, I need to put some, some base class. Okay, so you, what you do is you just, you take, you take a knit, you hoist it up into a, up into a, a, a base class like that. Pert, okay, good. Um, and you turn your code into something like this. I'm actually a little curious, I mean, how many of you have seen t this technique? done before, a few, eh, a few, few people. Kind of the idea here is that you, you sort of start with that. Actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write this to a file called, uh, I'm gonna call it uh, structly here, okay, so. Okay. Every, everything has to have an LI on it for this talk here. So, so this is gonna be my, my structly file. What's gonna happen with that, I'm assuming I haven't made any mistakes, is that you could just, you could say, well, you know, make a stock, you know, goo 100, 490.1 or something. And it would just go ahead and, and populate all the values there. It's, it, it's, it's essentially what's happening is you're sort of listing what the attribute names are. And then we're using the init function just to go through and set them. Okay, now, so you had a question up in the front. Somebody had a question here, so. Yeah. Well, it, it turns out that, that class variables are accessible through the instance. Like you can say self.fields and it will go through the instance. It, 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 it will pick it up. That's actually a very weird thing about Python, by the way. I don't know whether people have thought about that, but the fact that you can access a class variable through an instance is a little weird. I mean, it's a, a little weird in terms of OO programming sort of style. But... Um, I guess you could, you could do this another way, too. I mean, it, 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 like, you, you could, here, here would be the other way of doing that. Instead of going self underscore fields, you could chase the class attribute and do it like that, too. So, you know, there's a couple of options there. Actually, that might make it a little bit more explicit about what's going on there. So I'll, I'll go ahead and leave that. All right, so, so you, might, you might do some trick like that. Now, does anybody see any downsides to doing that? Well, I, I didn't. I didn't hear. The, I didn't hear the comment. But one, 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 one problem with this is that you lose a lot of like useful debugging kinds of stuff. Like, uh, like one of the things if you if you tried to do a help on the class, you don't really get any information about the the calling signature. You know, it's like just star args. Um, you could if you if you don't call it with the you know the right number of arguments. It's like, oh, okay, that's kind of weird. It, 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 did, it, it, did S and it did name and shares, but then it didn't do price. So I, I got to like, hmm, okay, I got to add some er extra checking to it. Another problem with it is you don't get keyword arguments. So you've, you've like lost all of, all of the ability to, to do keywords. So that, that basically doesn't work. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you lose by doing that, that trick. So, so what you've done is you've done like a bunch of convenience, but you've kind of, I don't know, you've sort of messed it up for yourself. I mean, basically no support for keyword arguments. There's no argument signature on it or anything. Actually, one thing about argument signatures, by the way, I'm gonna get into this. Uh, there's a new feature in the inspect module 
that will tell you the signature of things. Uh, this, new, this is this new signature feature. You can basically say inspect.signature on anything and it will tell you the calling signature of it. You can actually, get, you can actually look at it and pull information out of it and do different things, different things with it. We're going to do some more with signatures in a second here. So, so this, is, this is a little bit of a problem. It's like, hmm, okay, no support for, um, no support for uh, keyword arguments and, and other things. So I want to talk about signatures. This is a, um, a new Python 3 feature that got added here, okay, uh, putting the, um, the signature on, on things that only showed up in Python 3. And so let me do a, a demo. Um, it turns out that, that in Python 3, you can actually construct function signature objects yourself. Okay, so here, here's sort of a, an interesting thing that you can do. I'll do this interactive. You can say from inspect, import um, parameter and signature. And what you can do is you could take like a list of fields. So let's say you had a, a fields list like name, shares, price. You could actually come in here and, and make like a parameter list. So you could say, okay, let's make a bunch of parameters by basically, I'll do a list comprehension here. Just saying, okay, I'm gonna make a parameter where this is sort of the, the field name, F name. And then it's gonna look a little bit funny, but um, you have, there's, it's sort of like an enum or something. You're basically saying, okay, I wanna make a parameter that's po either positional or keyword. I hope I've done that right. Okay, so you're going to do something like that. This is going to, this is essentially going to make like a bunch of function parameters. And, and then what you can do is you, is you can make a signature out of that. You can just say, well, let's make a signature out of all those parameters. Okay, so you get a signature object. If you print it out, it will sort of tell you the signature on there. And you're saying, hmm, okay, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of interesting. Um, now, now the question that comes up is like, what, what in the world could you do with that? Um, well, it turns out that with these signature um, arguments, here's the, here's the cool thing that you can, that you can do. Um, you can actually bind them to star args and star star keyword args. It's kind of a neat little trick. So um, one, of the, one of the things that you could do is you could say, okay, let's, uh, let's just try that here. You could, you could basically make a function like foo, star args, star star uh, keyword args. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna do like a, a binding operation like this. So I'm gonna say, take that signature and bind, bind, it to the, uh, bind it to the values there. And then what you can do is you can, um, you can sort of pull the values off. Um, I, I'm hoping that this will work here. So let, let, let's just try this here. So, so what's gonna happen is, um, okay, so foo one, two, three, it basically comes in and says, okay, name was one, shares was two, price was three. Turns out that this binding thing is really smart about what it does. Um, supports keyword arguments. Get things in the right order. Um, it will do argument checking, saying that it's lacking, uh, you know, basically lacking a default value. Didn't get a value for price. It will do all the error checking that you would normally do for a function. It's basically taking a signature and it's enforcing it on star args, star star keyword args. Hopefully you sort of see that, see that going on. That is actually kind of a, kind of a neat feature um, because you can use that. Okay, so it does, all the, it does all the error handling, all the enforcement of stuff. You can actually use that in some of this structure code. Now this is gonna look a little bit, a little bit nasty, but what you, what you could do is basically write a little utility function where you'd say, okay, make a signature on it and then modify the init function to enforce the signature. So you, you, could, take, you could take this code and, and basically do that. So let me, uh, let, me, let me bring in some code here. I'm really fast at typing, by the way. I'm gonna pair that in advance. So what I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm basically saying, okay, let's, let's do a make signature I'm gonna modify the structure class so that it looks for signatures instead, and then does, uh, does the init from that. What's gonna happen uh, to, sort of, to sort of make that work is now all the classes are basically gonna do something like this, where they're gonna say, okay, signature is equal to make, you know, make signature on the, on the fields. So it's, so it's gonna look a little different than before. Okay, I'm just, I'm just gonna do the two there. Okay, so let's, let's, let's just do that. But what will happen there 
is that all of a sudden, your classes are just gonna behave so much nicer. Um, I mean, essentially, if, it, if that works, you'll be able to make you know, classes using any combination of, of keyword arguments, positional arguments, things like that. So you could you know, do you know, keywords, And, and so forth, and it just sort of works. And it has error checking built into it too. So if you, uh, if you don't pass in enough arguments, it, it fails and so forth. In fact, even if you, uh, if you print out the signature of stock, it comes up and says, oh, that's name shares price. Very minor little thing, but it's, it's kind of cool though. I mean, it's, it's, it's like you're providing a little bit more information to the user. It's actually simplifying quite a bit of code that you would have to write normally. I don't know whether anybody has ever tried to do that. Um, if you've ever tried to write code that takes star args and star star keyword args and enforce like a calling convention on it, it's actually pretty ugly. I mean, you're kind of nodding your head up here. I mean, it's, it's really ugly. I mean, you have to check for all like, like all sorts of duplicates. Like was it duplicated as a positional argument? Was it as a keyword argument? Do you have too many values? Really horrible stuff. So this simplifies that. All right, so you can do some, some interesting things with these, these signature objects. But then you sort of get a new problem, which is that is actually kind of annoying. At least I think it's kind of annoying. I mean, it's, it, it's like, yeah, okay, you know, you've got, you've got signatures being generated there. And you sort of ask this question, well, can you simplify that in some way? And the answer to all questions of can it be simplified in some way is always Meta classes, basically. Okay, so um, yeah, you, you, th th basically you have a problem here involving class definitions, either class decorators or meta classes, and you could actually solve this problem doing some kind of um, e actually either technique. Um, one of the things that you could do is maybe some trick with class decorators. You could say, okay, we'll add a signature to this thing, and then use it like a decorator. You could just say, okay, add a signature name shares price, and then it would it would sort of you know, drop that on there. I'm not sure I, I don't know, it kind of works okay, but I'm not sure I really like that. The other alternate uh, approach would be to define a sort of a, a meta class to do this. So um, what this is doing, let me, let me just sort of quickly describe it. It's basically making the class, and then after it makes the class, it essentially makes the signature automatically for you, and then just sort of drops it on the class. So it, it, it's basically doing code for yourself. It's kind of automating this thing that's kind of, a, kind of annoying. So it's, it's actually setting that field's attribute. So this is, this is if, if, you, if you took that approach, you could actually simplify this code back to what it was initially. I mean, essentially, um, what, what you would do to do this is um, you know, add this, this sort of meta class that does this like signature generation in there and then you would sort of use that as your structure-based class, and then you, could, then you could actually go back to this like simple thing. Okay, so you, you, could, you could hide the fact that, they're, that you're doing that. Okay, so go, you're, going, you're going back to, to what you had before. Okay, so let's uh, so 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 that's that's sort of taking you back to that simple definition. This actually is is it, one, one way to view that is that, I mean th this is actually one of the the powers of some of this meta class stuff is that you can you can actually take like classes and then sort of tweak the definition a little bit or simplify what's going on behind the scenes. I mean I actually want to make signature objects, but I don't want the user to have to worry about that. I'm sort of saying okay, well I'm gonna I'm gonna automate that. And the way that I'm going to do it is basically injecting a meta class in there. All right, let me see how people are doing with that. Everyone, uh, okay, so this is, I haven't seen too many people running out in a panic yet. So, um, so that, that, that's, that's, that's one thing. Um, one, other, um, one other thing that I, I, I guess I would mention too is some of this meta class stuff. Um, you know, you know let, let me, actually, let me go back to this like decorator thing. Um, one thing with, with decorators versus meta classes, I think, is this, this element of how much stuff are you going to put into a base class. Um, I don't know if that's going to make sense, but it, it, it turns out that if you're, if you're going to expand the structure class to have lots and lots of functionality, like maybe wrapper methods or type checking or anything like that, um, that actually might be an argument for doing some of the meta class stuff. 
I mean, it, it, it turns out that when you're working with meta classes, you're, you're kind of more deeply embedded in the type system, if you will. And if you need to do things like type checking or propagate code, that is, that is, that is probably something to consider. You know, sometimes you'll, you'll hear people say, ah, you should never use meta classes. It's just, like too confusing, too mind blowing. It's like, just use, you know, just use a decorator or something. I'm not sure I totally buy that. I mean, it's, you know, it, you, you do have to kind of think about like the problem that you're solving. Um, and, you know, one little subtle aspect of that is that generally with a class decorator, what you're doing is you're just sort of tweaking some class maybe all on its own. It's just like, oh, take this class and do something to it. Um, meta classes actually come into play if you're trying to do some kind of modification, maybe in combination with inheritance. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a more powerful idea. But one thing to keep in mind is that I, I don't think you should uh, quickly like dismiss any option when you're doing this meta programming stuff. I mean, it's like it's, all of this stuff is meant to work together, but it's, it, it's used to solve sort of different kinds of problems. So, so there is that element there. So let me just pause for a second. Question in the back. And I'll, so you have to shout it out. I'll try to repeat it. So. The, the signature attributes, is it significant in Python uh, apart from this demo? Okay. Yeah, the question about the signature attribute apart from this demo. Um, I think it, it, it actually is significant. Like there are parts of, the, of Python that look for that. Like the, actually, actually the inspect signature function like, like if you say print, um, you know, like that thing that I just did there, print inspect signature, actually looks for that double underscore signature object. Um, the one thing that, it's, that is missing, I don't know that there's any core developers sitting in here, but um, it turns out that the help function does not look at signatures for some reason. And it should, I think it should actually. I mean, it comes up and basically it says uh, star arc, star star keyword arc. Um, I, don't, I can't think of any reason why the help function shouldn't look at it. It just may be that it's such a modern feature that they just, you know, it just hasn't worked its way out. But it's, yeah, there are, part, there are parts of Python that are looking at that. Uh, I could see, uh, you know, IDEs, you know, like people writing IDEs for Python might, that this is something that they may want to tuck away, saying, mm, maybe we should look at the signature attribute to find out, you know, what the, what the signature thing is. Um, I believe that signature might also be propagated by decorators as well. Now, I'd have to double check, I'd like that wraps thing may propagate the signature as well. So I'd have to, I'd have to check that. But yeah, there, there is a significance to the naming of that. Another question here. I have a different approach to this kind of constructor thing. Uh, you can just look at local as the first thing. You take the, in the, in the in it, you look at locals, and then you set the locals in the name. You keep the signature in place like this, you name it, and then you would make locals and write a small helper that just modifies uh, the name of the dictionary. It's just one line. No matter class, it's pretty easy to understand it, but it's not the same thing. So that's, it's a more likely solution, I would say. Okay, you're talking about, let me, let me just make sure I understand uh, what you're proposing. And then it goes to the locals and you, you pop up cells, you delete the cell from the locals picture, and then you just set it, same thing you take this name value. Okay, so you, like here you would be using locals then. Okay, I'd, I'd have to see that. I mean, I, I, I don't want to get into it now, but... I mean, I, I will have to admit that I'm a, I'm a little bit leery of, of messing around with locals too much doing this, partly because uh, you can run into problems if you ever start messing around with things like slots and stuff, so... Okay. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll catch you later on that. Okay. Okay, I'll have to see it in the in the break or something like that. So yeah, let's let, let's not go down that uh, that path here. So yeah, question all the way in the back though. Mm -hmm. uh, do you need to bind that in the structure? Can bind be pushed to the class? Can it be? Like your question is: Can bind be pushed to the, to the meta class? 
I don't think so, because bind is basically executed at the time of instance creation. And meta class is more about class definition time. So it's a, it's a completely different, different thing there. All right. Well, let's go ahead and, uh, and move on uh, from that. Now, one of the things uh, that we're going to do here I want to talk about the dot operator, um, owning the dot. I believe that those are the words of actually Raymond Hedinger. I think he gave a tutorial where it's like, you own the dot, man, or something like that. So um, Python actually provides the means for you to do a lot of customization. And I want to talk about sort of this correctness thing. Okay, we did a bunch of uh, data structures. Okay, so um, duct type. Okay, so you have the, this, this stock class. Okay, stock, you know, name, it's... Uh, so forth. So if name shares price, somebody might actually want to do some validation on that or either type checking or validation or, I don't know, posting on Hacker News or something. I, I don't know. Okay, so there's going to be, uh, you know, this, this sort of correctness thing. And if you know about this, you, you might know that you can upgrade attributes through the use of properties. I mean, if you were, if you were really concerned about type checking, you could potentially define a property for these things, saying, okay, yeah, there's a, okay, there's a, a getter function and a setter, and then in the set, I'll, I'll do like, you know, type check and value check and all, all this stuff, and that, that, that works. Okay, I mean, you can, you can take a, an attribute and you could put a bunch of type checking on it and, and your, your program would, would crash. Uh, the only problem with that is that it gets really annoying. I mean, I don't know whether you've done much with properties, but if I had to do that all the time, I would just, I think I'd just quit and, I don't know, open up a, a hot dog stand or something like that. And it's like I wouldn't want to like write code like that all the time in my, my program. It's pretty, pretty repetitive. So you may want to simplify that in, in, in some way, but you, it, it's, it's actually kind of surprisingly tricky in the example that I've given you there. Um, one of the things that, that's sort of tricky about the, the, this particular case is that I actually have two different things intertwined with each other. I've got type checking and I have like domain checking or value checking going on at the same time. So it's like, hmm, okay, that's a little messy. And so you might run into this problem. It's like, well, how would I, how would I solve that? How would I structure this? So if you want to do things with the dot and you want to do it for real, like not, not with properties, but you really want to get into the guts of Python, you're going to do it using descriptors and basically the descriptor protocol. Now, if you have, have not seen descriptors before, here is uh, kind of the, the gist of the idea. So let me um, make a descriptor class. I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep it in my uh, file that I'm working with here. Ba basically, the idea of a descriptor is that you get to own the dot operator. I'll explain this name attribute in a, in a second here. So, okay, so uh, what you can do is you can write a, write a get method that looks like this. Uh, I'm just gonna put a print in there for starting, not, well, not like that, okay. So. <laughs> I'm, gonna I'm gonna lose points like every single time I do that. And then you can define a, a set attribute looks like this, print out the value, and then you can also do a delete attribute. Okay. Let me put in the name here too. Okay. So, uh, so, so what you do is you have a, you have a class that looks like, like this. Now, th what this is, is this is basically owning the dot operator for a single attribute. Okay, so this is, this is essentially going to own the dot for a single thing. And here's how this, here's how this works. Um, what you would do is, is drop this into a class definition. Okay, let's say you had a class and you're like, you know what, I want shares to be captured by this descriptor object. What you would do is you would do something like this. Okay, you're sort of, you know, put, you know, you're putting this thing in the class definition. So, you're, you're basically redefining the meaning of dot shares. That's what you're doing there. And it turns out that if you, if you do that and you try your code, so let's, let's, let's try this out here. 
I think I was calling this Struckly here. Okay, so um, let's say you, you decided to make, a, make, an, make an object. All of a sudden, your cat, you're basically saying, oh, okay, set shares got set to 100. Um, what's what's going to happen is you've basically intercepted shares every, like all the operations on shares. You're, you're setting the getting, the setting, deleting, okay? Now, now one of the things that, so, so, and just for that attribute, by the way, like if you look up price or anything, you're not, you're not seeing anything. It's just basically on shares. You went in, think of it like a laser beam. You went in there and you said, okay, shares, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to redefine what you're, what you're doing there. So what you can do with, with a descriptor is, is sort of do fine-grained redefinition of what happens with the dot. Now, everyone's still, still kind of kind of with me on that. Now, here's what happens in these descriptor objects. Um, it turns out that this instance argument is basically the instance that you're working with. It would be like the stock, basically, like 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 that that like a. I'll just put you know. A stock instance. And typically what you're going to do in, the, in these methods is you're going to directly manipulate the underlying instance in some way. There's various ways that you can go about that, but one of the, one of the ways that you could do it would be to do things like reach directly into the uh, like instance dictionary, for instance, and just say, okay, I'm going to go down into your dictionary and yank something out of the dictionary. Or the self here, I'm going to go down and into the... Um, into your instance dictionary and like drop a value on there. Okay, so this is this is this is sort of what's going to happen. Is this thing is, is essentially you're, you're you're capturing the uh, the dot operator. Do I have a typo somewhere? Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, yeah, there's the, the, that problem. We're, we'll, just, we'll just never delete anything. That's the, uh, that would be the part that we don't unit test and we just ship to see whether anybody ever, uh, ever, ever, ever executes that code there. Okay, so, um, so this, this is the thing that you can do. Basically, you can write a descriptor where you capture the dot operator and you would say, hmm, okay, that's, that's, that's kind of interesting. You, know, sort of, you define that. Um, you have to go in the class definition and you're going to get customized handling of the different attributes, okay? So, so this, is, this is what the code basically looks like, is, is something like that. You're capturing get, set, and delete operations. Um, one of the things that, that's going on here is basically this name attribute is essentially the name of where the piece of data is being stored on the object. Like, you know, every single piece of data has to be stored somewhere. That's the name that I'm using to store it, okay? So that's, that's like a key in the instance dictionary. Um, you're doing direct manipulation of the instance dictionary there and, and, and basically pulling data in and out. Now, one little uh, subtlety about this, it turns out that um, if you're using the same name in the instance dictionary, the get method is actually optional. Uh, it turns out that if you're, if you're, if you're going to mess around with, with this dict attribute, you can actually get rid of some of the code. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that in my example here. Um, Turns out that for getting, I'm not really doing much there, so I, so I, c I can actually get rid of that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get rid of that. Just focus on the set there, okay? So, so I, I can basically customize the, the set operation. Okay, so, so do something like that. Now, this is where this is gonna start to um, get interesting. Okay, you're saying, okay, hmm, okay. I'm gonna, I'm, basically the way that you would start using a descriptor is like this. You would say, okay, I'm gonna have stock structure, maybe some fields, and then I'm gonna start declaring things like name, shares, price, all to be descriptors. I'm basically gonna define them as descriptors. Now, there's a pretty good chance that you've seen stuff like this before. Um, for example, if you've used things like Django or web framework, um, you get in there and they're, like you've talked about like the def definition of models. Right, you know, model fields and things. They'll say, oh yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna find a class and oh, you know, one of the fields is like a car field and the other's like a date field and then a primary key and things like that. You see class definitions, it sort of looked like that. And that actually gives you kind of an indication of how this stuff is gonna get used. Um, it turns out that you can start building basically checks into this whole descriptor mechanism. Now, so, so let's, say, let's say you wanted to do type checking. 
All right, let's go ahead and add that here. Um, I could basically make a class where I would say, okay, I'm gonna make something called typed, which is gonna inherit from descriptors. And then what I'm gonna do is just, uh, uh, what, uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll make a, like a, a, an expected type here. This, that's what this is, okay? And I'll just redefine a set method to add a little bit of type checking. So I'll say, well, if it's, if, if it's not you know, an instance of this, uh, Of that, of that type, raise a type error. I should probably be using the class there, but I'm not gonna worry about it. Okay, so, so you, could, you could do something like that, and then I'm just going to pass this back onto the, um, the, the set parameter for, um, or the set method for, for the base class. Okay, so, so what I'm doing here is I'm kind of like extending this basic descriptor. Where I'm saying, okay, well, I'm gonna add, I'm gonna add type checking to that. Um, one of the reasons why I've got it sort of formulated like that is I can easily specialize this. I can, basically, I can say integer is typed where the type is equal to int and then float is equal to uh, typed where the type is equal to float. Um, string is equal to typed where the, where, where Type is equal to str. Basically, building this sort of this sort of thing out, and what you can start doing now is you, I could come down here and I could say, okay, stock, you know, name is equal to string name, and then shares is equal to integer shares. Price is equal to float price. Okay, if you've done anything with these web frameworks, all, all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait a minute. Okay, I definitely sort of started to see things similar to that. Okay, so so what we're doing is kind of kind of extending this thing out. Just delete that for a second. I'm gonna, I'm gonna write this out to a new thing here called typely, okay? We're, all of a sudden we're doing type checking, so we, we better give it a new name. And if you try this, let's, let's, let's just try it out. Okay, so, so what you've got now, okay, typely.py, is you should be able to make these structure classes. I still have that print statement in there, so you see it setting stuff. And it's, it should be enforcing type checking. I mean, you, could, you can change things, but if I try to change the name to something else, it blows up, okay? So it's doing a little bit of validation on the, on the data here. Okay, so that's, it, you kind of look at that and say, well, that's, that's, that, that's kind of cool, actually. At least I think it's kind of cool that you can, you can own the dot operator like that, customize the set and put some validation in there. Let me see if everybody's doing okay so far with that. Guys, still, still with me on that? You know, I guess the only thing I don't quite get is how it's. This is just a descriptor. There's no magic. So when I do a get and there's nothing there, how does it fall back to the other? Yeah, the question: If there's no get, how does it fall back to the thing that was there before? I think it's just programmed that way. <laughs> I mean, that might be kind of a a dumb answer, but I think, you know, it's the, I think, you know, just the internals of the interpreter, it look, you know, for descriptors, it looks to see if there's a get method, and if not, it ex there's some default implementation of the get that's underneath the cover. Um, if it's not, if that's actually undocumented behavior or something like that, then I'm just gonna burn in hell for presenting <laughs> this, this tutorial. But um, I, ha I have seen that before. That well, one, one critical thing about that, by the way, though, the name has to match which in, what's in the dictionary. I mean, one, one really uh, subtle thing about this is that if you look at the underlying instance dictionary, it basically has like price, name, shares in there. And when you're accessing like s.shares, it, it actually intercepts that before it hits that instance dictionary. Turns out that if, it, that, that if the underlying dictionary had like different attribute names, like an underscore shares or an underscore price or something like that, you would have to use a get method because there would be a mismatch between like the name of the descriptor and the name of the attribute. So yeah, there are, there are some subtle, uh, subtle aspects of that. All right, now let's, let's go ahead and, and, and like add to this further. Um, one of the things that we had uh, we had earlier too, is we had the, the value checking thing. That's actually pretty easy to do too. Like if you wanted to do um, like a domain checking, you could say, okay, let's make a positive descriptor where we'll define a set method. And then how would you check if it's positive? Well, you would just say, well, if the value is less than zero, 
go ahead and raise a value error. Some mathematician will probably get me for saying, well, technically that just means non-negative or something like that, but that's, that, that's fine, okay. So, um, okay, so we'll, 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 write, we'll write a new descriptor value, kind of see what's going on here. It sort of says, okay, we'll just check the, we'll check the value. Eh, if it's not, not right, we'll just raise a value error. And then we'll just, we'll just delegate to the, uh, the, the parent there. Now, you might look at that and say, okay, well, how, how is that supposed to be used? Well, what if, what if defined there, does anybody know what that is or how that class is supposed to be used? That's actually an example of a mix-in class. Um, the only way that that would actually be used properly is usually is, is through multiple inheritance. Let me show you what I mean. Let's say you wanted to have a positive integer. You would say, well, how would that work? Well, that's basically an integer combined with positive. And let's say you wanted to have a positive float. That's a float combined with positive. I'm kind of doing this on purpose to, to make everybody's head explode with the super function, basically. Uh, uh, so so what, what you've got there is uh, what, I'm, what I'm doing is actually combining like two different implementations. I'm combining type checking and I'm combining value checking together into some to some new thing, and then I can sort of use that in my class down here. I could say, mm, okay, let's do, um, let's do positive integer and do positive float, and let's just see what happens with that. Um, if I've done this right, I should be able to set, you know, shares, I can't set shares to like a string Okay, get a type error, and I can't set it to a negative value. Got two different checks going on there, basically type checking, value checking, and some other things. Now, that code that, 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 that I just wrote there, that is some extremely subtle code like this. Um, it turns out that the order absolutely matters there. Do you know why? It's a, it, it basically, the reason it matters, like let's say I were to flip it around, I'm going to do positive first and then integer. If I did that, I would actually be trying to do a numeric comparison, possibly on a non-numeric value. It turns out that, the, that it will go in the order that's listed there. So that one actually, like, like this one, would not actually work like I wanted to. I mean, it would, it, what would happen is, is, is if, you, um, if you did that, like here's what would happen if you said s.shares is equal to, um, you know, like a lot. You'd get a completely different error saying unorderable types. Like, what in the world is that about? Basically, the order is sort of, is sort of messed up with that. So, so the, the, the order absolutely matters. This, this is going to turn everybody off of multiple inheritance forever here. Okay. So, uh, I, I, just, just as a disclaimer, this tutorial, as you'll see in a second, aims to combine every horrible, insane thing that you could possibly have at once. Which you, you'll, we'll get to that as we, as we go further. So, so, so you can add the, add the value checking in there. It's like, hmm, okay, interesting. Um, one thing about this, um, a multiple inheritance is actually being used as kind of a basic building block here. We have all these descriptors, and one way to think about them is they're like Lego blocks that are gonna stack together, although they have spikes uh, sticking on it. So, so you have a, you, you're basically gonna have Lego blocks that sort of stack together. Just to be clear about that, the super function is not the spike. The super function is the little connector socket. The spike is just for show to keep coworkers out of your code. Okay. So, um, so you have these like little, little, little building blocks. And, and really to understand what's going on here, you have to kind of get into the depth of the method resolution order. This is a big topic in Python. It's, it's I don't know, we could do a whole tutorial on that. But one of, the th one of the things that happens with classes is that when you use multiple inheritance, Python determines this sort of method resolution order list that orders all the, all the classes. So you'll see this thing going positive integer, integer, typed, positive, descriptor, object, thing, things like that. Um, this actually sort of defines like the control flow of all those set functions. It's extremely, 
Um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's extremely kind of subtle, but what happens is when I do like this positive integer thing here, integer positive, it will come into this code and it'll say, okay, integer, that one is first. So I'm gonna come into the, into the integer code up here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come into this thing. I'm gonna do the type check. And then I'm gonna do this, this super call. Okay, I'm gonna say, okay, call the super class. Now here's the, the mind blowing thing. That does not go to the parent. It goes to the next thing on that MRO list, which happens to be the positive class. So not, not the parent usually. Okay, so, so what will happen is that will basically come over here and go into this. Okay, so it will say like, oh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call that. Now we're gonna do the value checking. And then this super call here will basically go up to the final, up to the final base class. Yeah, so you, if you see that, actually, if you, if you look at that, and you said something like, like if, we, if we looked at positive integer MRO, for instance, you'd actually sort of see that. It's sort of saying, well, it starts on positive integer, it goes to positive, then it goes to integer, then it goes to typed, and then it goes to descriptor. It basically works its way up through this... Uh, up, up through this chain. This is a pretty advanced um, thing with the super function. I mean, the, you know, the, the super function actually kind of gets a bad rap in Python sometimes because it, you know, people, you know, they try to use it and they may not quite understand its relationship to multiple inheritance. You know, the fact that it doesn't necessarily go to the parent. You can get these diamond diagrams. Um, yeah, get the diamond gets collapsed down into this list. Um, I think that the, the thing with super is that there are some amazingly powerful programming techniques with like mix-in classes and composition of classes that you can get into with that. Um, the, 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 the really downside of it is that you can, uh, you know, there's a lot of articles out there on the line, you know, where it's like, oh, you know, Python super considered, you know, dangerous or, you know, things like that, where they, they kind of rant against it. You know, maybe, maybe it is dangerous if you don't know what it does, but it's, it's definitely, definitely a feature of that. Yeah, questions over here. Really quickly, before we get too far from a basic descriptor, uh, I, I can still get into the dictionary of an instance and, and inject a bad, badly typed value there, right? So it's not quite a contract. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just overriding sugar on the data. Yeah, yeah, the question is, can you get into the dictionary and override it bypassing all this stuff? And the answer is definitely, yeah. Yeah, if you're evil and you know what's going on, you can get into the dictionary and, and, and do things. Uh, now, one of the things that I thought I would um, add to this, we're almost getting into the break, but I thought I would end with sort of two more descriptor objects that are kind of interesting. It turns out, turns out if you like this, this multiple inheritance thing, which you probably don't at this point, but that's, that's, that's okay anyway. Um, you, can, you can take this further, like here is, um, I, I, I have this already kind of programmed here. Um, you could actually do a descriptor that does think something like length checking and this one is actually going to uh, blow your mind a little bit. Um, actually, let me move this just down a little bit because it kind of uh, comes into play here. Um, okay, uh, uh, has a size descriptor, has an init function. Okay, this is this is probably a technique that you have rarely seen. Um, you're not generally supposed to do init functions with multiple inheritance especially ones that take custom arguments. You're like, what in the world? Look, okay, you have to look at look, look what's going on here. It's like max len. This is one of these keyword only arguments. You can only do that by keyword. It takes a star args, it takes a keyword args, and a max len. It then pulls out its value, and then it just does super without the keyword argument. It's kind of like, this, this is sort of weird what's going on here, but it like takes an argument and then like pulls it out of the, the calling convention and then just passes all the right remaining arguments along. And you're like, hmm, okay. So you could, you could you, it, and then, then you could do things like this. You could say, oh, okay, I'm gonna make a sized string where it's like, oh, a string, inherit. it's a string and it's sized. It's like, hmm, okay, that's, that's, that's kind of interesting what's going on there. Um, the only thing that would make that even better, <laughs> you'll love this. No, not Metaclass. No, no, no. You, you know what it is, though. It's, it's, it's um, you probably know what it is. It makes everything better. It's, it's uh, regexes. 
Okay, so, um, so you, could, you could do something like, uh, you could do like this, you could say, well, this is a regex descriptor that takes a pattern, does something, does like a pattern match, and now you could do things like, well, let's have a sized regex string. You know, it's a sized string, regex, tons and tons of multiple inheritance here. You can never have too much, especially with regex. So you could come, in, you could come down here and you say, well, okay, well, now this, this, this name thing, this is like a, what did I, what was it, like a sized regex string or name where like the pattern, you could basically specify a pattern, you know, it's going to be you know, A through Z plus... Uh, you know, star and max len equals eight or something like that. Okay, so you, now you have the, the, the keep, keep in mind, this is like really freakish, weird stuff going on. You have like two different init functions being combined together with different arguments. Okay, one has a pattern argument. One has a max len argument. They've been like sort of merged into one thing. And it will basically work, assuming that, that I have made no typos here. So, okay, so, so if I've done this right, I shouldn't be able to set like a long string because it's too big. I basically set a max length of, of eight. Um, I also should not be able to set like, um, like a bad pattern, basically, so that's an invalid string. On top of that, it's got like you can't set a type. So this thing has a whole bunch of things going on. It's like type checking, plus regexes, plus ch length checking. You've got a whole bunch of crazy composition through inheritance. And you've just left the building, basically, here. Okay, so, um, so there's, it's, okay, so I kind of kind of go through those slides there, and it's, it, and it, and it, this whole business with this init function, I think is actually a kind of a wild underappreciated thing about keyword only arguments in Python. It turns out that, you know, the, the ability to do these keyword only arguments actually opens up a really kind of interesting new programming technique that allows you to like compose functions involving the star. Like you could have a function with star arg, star star keyword args, and then you could have this extra keyword argument like stuck in there. And it turns out that those keyword arguments, like if you pull the argument out and then don't pass it along, you can actually get these functions to like compose with each other in any order. That like each one will like take its own argument, like pull it out, call it other functions, and it will just like all work. You could probably do this in Python 2, but it is not nearly as elegant as that. I mean, that's a, you know, very, uh, very sort of sneaky, sneaky idea. Yeah, this is my, I don't know if you can see that. Uh, you see that there, you know, it's like awesome, man. You know, with like all this, all this multiple inheritance uh, uh, craziness. Now, um, it's still kind of annoying, all the code. <laughs> We're trying to type there. I mean, we have the, we have the fields thing. Um, name shares price, name shares price. Eh, a little, a little bit annoying. So, uh, let's take a break. That's the, the sneaky, uh, you know, apocalypse now uh, scene there. So when we, uh, I, think it's, I think it actually is break time. I'm showing like two, about 2.50. Do you guys know in the back, uh, the tutorial guys, is it about? Okay, I'm going to declare it break time. So I think we have like a, is it a 20-minute break for the, something like, okay. So tw 20 minutes, we'll come back and then we'll build on this. Okay, with AV, thumbs up on that, okay. Um, the thing we're going to start with here is uh, this, this annoyance that we kind of ended with. I mean, we've been messing around. We, we, we've got sort of, we kind of have two different things going on at the same time. We've got this, this signature checking stuff, and then we've got this type checking, value checking stuff, and they're not really unified together very well at this point. Um, one of the consequences of that is that there's a, sort of a lot of uh, repetition in the definition of these classes. Like there's the, you know, the declaration of the fields, and then you have, you know, repetition. Like how many times does name appear in there? It's like it appears one. There's name there. There's name over on the left. There's name in the in the string there. Um, quite a bit. Of, you know, it's, it's it's quite a bit of sort of repetition. And uh, if you have that problem. You may want to push this a little bit further. Of course, you know what the solution to the problem is, right? It's um, yes, yes, meta classes. So um, let me drop that on there and show you what happens with this. So um, 
It turns out that, that you, you can solve that, that sort of problem by introducing uh, a new meta class into the, into the mix here. So I'm, I'm gonna change the, uh, the meta class that I had before. Let me make sure I have this right. To do something a little bit different here. Okay, so it's, it's almost the same code as, as before, except I've got two, well, I've got a couple of new things going on. The first new thing that's going on is the use of the, uh, well, the collections, I'm basically using an ordered dictionary all of a sudden. Hopefully you know about that. If you haven't, if you haven't, if you haven't seen that feature of Python, there's basically a, you know, a dictionary keeps things in order in the collections module. And then what I'm, I'm doing in my meta class is I'm, ask, I'm, I'm basically adding a new method called underscore prepare. I'm like, huh, under, double underscore prepare. This is a new thing. This is a Python 3 thing that you do not have in Python 2. And um, what this method does is it returns the dictionary that's supposed to be used during class creation. Okay, so like the, when you execute the class body, it executes in a dictionary. That returns the dictionary that's going to be used. And you would say, well, why would you care about that exactly? Well, the thing that, that, that you can do with that is it lets you completely get rid of the fields attribute. You, you can basically take that and say, goodbye. And what will happen is it will record the order of the attributes based on the order that they're listed in the class. This is very, very subtle, right? It's like, it's like hmm, okay, I'm gonna pick up the order there. And then, um, so that, that's one of the things that that meta class is doing. It's, it's essentially, this, that's what this is doing. It's essentially saying, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just pick up all the, th I'm gonna go through the class dictionary, look at all the things that were, that were descriptors. It's special because it's actually going to keep them in order. Okay, that's, that's the whole feature of this, this ordered dictionary. It keeps things in order. Um, the other thing that you can do at this point is go ahead and fill in the name field. It turns out that the key of, these, of, this, of this fields list is actually the name that was used in the class dictionary. So I can, I can get rid of that as well. So you can come in here and say, well, okay, let's, let's, let's get rid of that. We don't need to specify the names anymore. And so what's happening is that you, you've, you've greatly reduce the amount of excess typing there. It's, this, this is actually looking a lot more like what you might see in Django or something, where it's just, you know, name is a regex string, shares is positive integer, price is positive float. You actually have this, this sort of meta class kind of doing this stuff for you behind the scenes. So, and the, and the magic for that is this prepare method. I mean, you can't do that with, well, you, you, you could do it without the prepare, but you have to do like a worse hack to get it to work. I mean, there's some techniques that you can, they can, you can do for that, but that's basically that prepare method returns some dictionary and then uses that for the execution of the class body. Um, just as a, as a and, and, and again, what, what ends up happening there is you're gonna record the order of the definitions in this ordered dictionary. And then the fact that they're ordered lets you collect this, uh, like basically lets you get the fields attribute. You can automatically sort of produce that so you don't have to provide it anymore. I don't know, everybody see that? See that there? Um, yeah, question. Is there a guarantee in the language that the class body uh, won't be subject to any pre-processing that would change the order? Or is that just a convention that we can rely on for now? Yeah, the question, is there any, is there any guarantee that, that something in the language won't change the order of execution? I'm not aware of anything that would change the order of execution uh, unless somebody's like doing source code rewriting or something. Like fancy being, compiler yeah, or compiler trick or, trick or something, yeah. But yeah, that, that, does, that does record the order. Um, there is another kind of angle on this stuff. I'm not, I'm not gonna explore it too much, but um, there, there are other things that you can do. Um, you know, like, like if you wanted to make even more complicated dictionary objects, like you could make something that inherits from ordered dict and then does things like duplicate detection. I mean, you could, you could actually write um, code that does some things like generate error messages for duplicate entries and class definitions. I mean, there's, this, is, this is sort of like open, open territory. I mean, one, one, one of the things that I, I kind of explored is not in this tutorial. Um, you, can, you can do things like multiple dispatch on methods doing tricks like that. Like you could have a, a, class, dic like a class dictionary that would record the methods that have, been, that have been seen. And then if you ever saw like the identical method name again, 
you could like look at that and do things with like this like look at the signatures of the methods and then try to do like a dispatch function and basically giving you like overloading or something i'm not sure i would advise doing that I mean, it's sort of horrible but i mean there's 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 there, there's there's various like opportunities for evil kind of doing that yeah it's just a dictionary any mapping object any mapping object will do. Um, so, so that's actually uh, what's going on in that code. It's basically just collecting all the names of stuff in the, in the class. I'm only looking for the ones that are descriptors, though. That's kind of a critical feat. I'm not interested in methods or anything like that. I'm just interested in the ones that were basically derived from that descriptor class that I made. So I'm just collecting those, making the, making the fields. Um, and then the, 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 you, you also get this simplification that the names are sort of coming from the dictionary keys. So I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of reducing that down, getting it, uh, getting it much, much simpler there. Um, and then you just, uh, you just sort of keep the, code, keep the code the same. So you can keep the class, keep the signature the same, do, do, do all the stuff uh, basically the same. Now there is, one little, there is one little minor technicality if you're gonna do this uh, class stuff. It turns out that when you actually go to create the class, like the real live working class, you cannot pass in an ordered dictionary or any custom dictionary at all. I think it actually has to be a full proper Python dictionary. So one of the things that, that will happen is that, you know, if you do any of this like custom dictionary stuff, you're sort of free to use that all the way up to the actual point where the class gets created. But th at that point, you have to turn it into a real dictionary. If you don't do that, you get some sort of weird uh, cryptic error message, I think, by, by doing I, Actually, I'm not even sure what the actual error message is for that, but we could, we could try it and see what happens. So, so like, like here, if you, don't turn, if you don't turn it into a proper dictionary, let, let, let's just see what happens with that. Well, actually, it did seem to, uh, hmm, interesting. Class object. Uh, It'll just fail randomly, yeah, maybe. Um, I hope it doesn't fail randomly. Well, I, I have to check into that. I know that uh, I have run into problems with that. You can create an object and type it stick. Yeah, let, let, let's see what happens with that. Well, it seems to be working, but I'm not. I'm not real. Uh, I'm not real convinced. I'm not. I'm not real convinced about it right now. Huh. Okay, well, let, let's, let's, let's not go there. Um, it, well, I'll leave it uncopied for now and just see if it breaks later on. Um, have, have, run into, have run into trouble with that. So, uh, so that's, that, that's one thing there. Now, um, yeah, all right. So now we're, now we're getting into some, some problems here. Okay, performance. Okay. Would, uh, anybody have, have, care to hazard a guess about what's going on with that? It's, MR, oh yeah, oh, this is, yeah, okay. So we just added a whole bunch of stuff. We added like the signature stuff, the generalized init, the type checking, value checking. It's not good. It's not good what happens here. Um, so if you, uh, yeah, it's bad. Um, so you, got the, you have the simple class versus all this meta stuff, and it's like, oh, man. Okay, so 86-time performance hit on instance creation. Might be able to do that better using this trick that Mike showed me, although you'd still take a hit there. I mean, I'm going to post that when I, wait, wait, after the tutorial. Um, one shining spot, attribute lookup, unaffected. <laughs> now you say, why is that? Um, it's because we didn't, in, we didn't implement get method. <laughs> we didn't implement it, so it's using the default. It's uh, nothing, nothing's there. Um, Assignment operation is also not real great. You know, like 30 times slower for that. Um, at, you know, attribute for the, like the name, that's like 58 times slower. I mean, keep in mind, it's doing type checking, it's doing a regex match, it's doing a length check. There's a lot of stuff going on in there. So, question here. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't really broken that down. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's like MRO chasing. Um, yeah, 
the actual checking is probably the minor part of it. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see that. So, so what we're going to do here, uh, this is going to be so bad. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say I'm going to burn in hell for what's about to happen here. So let's say you, um, you wanted to speed this up in some way. Um, yeah, the bright spot there. Yeah, okay, so a bunch of, bunch of you know, bottlenecks in here. Signature enforcement, multiple inheritance, super. Can you do anything without a total rewrite? Um, so here's one thought. It's so bad. Um, what if I wrote, what if I just started producing source code? I mean, this is such a bad idea. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's come up here and do that. Okay, so let, let's say I, um, I, I have a, I think this is frag six, okay? Make an init function. Okay, so l l let me just put that in there I'll talk about it. Okay, so what this, is, what this is, is it's like you give it a bunch of fields and it just makes an init function for you. It's kind of stupid what it does, actually. So, so the, way that, the way that it works is you, you would just say, okay, underscore make init, and then you just give it Let me do a print on it so you can see it a little bit better. It's just like, okay, make an init function. There it is. Okay, so um, yeah, okay, you sort of see where this is going. You could say, you know, okay, where's, where's, where's he going with that? Um, basically, take, you, take, you, you, you say, okay, I could take a list of fields and just make an init function. The obvious thing that I should do is just combine that with meta classes. So let's, just, let's just like put it in a meta class. Okay, so, so what, you, what you could do here is you could say, okay, I just, I just made like here. Okay, I just made the fields. So why don't I just come down here and just like make an init function. Um, what, what, what I'll do is I'll just say, you know what, um, init code is equal to make init out of field. Actually, I do need to probably put a little check here. If there actually are any fields, I'll do this. So I'll just say, okay, make an init, make the init code, and why don't we just execute it in the class dictionary that just got created here. Okay, so um, yeah, I, I'll do global. I, I'm a little bit unsure, unsure about that. But we'll just, what I'll do is I'll just execute it in the class dictionary, and then I'll just pass it on to the thing there. Okay, so uh, you're saying, oh, God, he's going to go I'm going to hell for that. Okay, so, uh, so it, in theory, if this works, um, I should just be able to get rid of the init function here. You know, let's just delete it. Okay, time. Let's, let's, just, let's just do that. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save this as a new thing here. Exactly. Okay, so... So, all right, so, so what's, what's going on here is it's, it's, it's gonna say, I'm going to say, okay, I'm just going to make an init function, hope that the thing, hope that the thing works. Actually, if I'm making an init function, I don't have to do the signature stuff anymore either. Yeah, let's get rid of that. Okay, so, uh, so, so I, don't need to, I don't need to do signatures anymore because, it's, it, because the signature is basically coming from the init function now. So, okay, so let, let, let's try that, see what happens. This will either work horribly or... Uh, or not. Let's do a help on stock. This will tell us if it, uh, okay. Name shares price. That looks good. Um, should, should work, okay. So, still has the type checking on there. Okay, so, so everything is the same, but basically we're, we're, we're generating code using the exec function and some like code generator stuff. Everybody still Still okay on that. In my defense, I will say that, that, the, uh, that the collections named tuple object uses an exec, uses exec, and since it was written by Raymond Henninger, I feel fully free to use exec. Uh, uh, here, okay, so, what? It returns its own source code. It returns its own, yeah, source code, yeah. So, uh, so, so you could do that. It's like, hmm, okay, that, that's kind of cool. You don't need signature anymore. Um, it does run considerably faster doing that. Um, so, if you uh, if you do that, it went for the simple class went from like you know went instead of in, instead of one to ninety one seconds. Now it's running seventeen seconds. So the definitely took a big hit on or, you know big drop in perform or increase in performance by doing that trick. It's still not going to be as fast because I'm doing a lot of type checking. I mean, there's sort of an unavoidable amount of type checking uh, doing there. 
But then, uh, then you can kind of take this a bit further, and you're like, huh, I wonder if I, um, okay, I got all these descriptors. You're going to like this. This is going to be good. Um, I wonder if I could do something with, with those. Um, I've got all these little code fragments for these set methods. I wonder if you could do something like stringing those together in some horrible, evil way. Um, and here, here's an idea on that. You're, th you're, th this is going to be bad. Um, what if I were to, um, okay, let me get rid of the print here. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to change this into uh, something else entirely. You'll, have, you'll see why this has to be a static method in a second. You're like, oh, good God, what is he doing now there? Okay, so, um, so what, I've, what I've done here is I got this like set code. I basically took the code and just put it into a string. I'm like, oh, man. Uh, I'm going I'm to go do that for um, all of these. It'll take a minute here, so, but it'll, it'll give you time to have this sink in a little bit here. Okay, so, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start producing, I'm going to start making the code basically as, as string. This, this is so bad that it's good. Basically. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm going to get rid of the super here. Okay, so if super is gone, you'll, you'll see why in a second. Okay, so, so I'm going through all these, uh, all these classes changing uh, the, uh, the set method into this like weird set code thing. We got a little bit of a quotation problem here. I gotta be careful with that, okay. Job security is going up considerably at this point. <laughs> Yeah, so we have a, yeah, let's, uh, let's do, let's do this, we're almost done here, okay, so. I wonder what part of the Balmer curve we're on at this point. <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, people know about that. Okay, getting, getting rid of the super function, too, gotta make sure that I, okay. Get rid of that, and I think there's one, one more that I need to do here. Am I? Is there one more that I'm missing? Is it? Ah, I got. I still have to fix some quoting stuff. Okay, so going through, all, going through all the code, and it's like I, I basically changed all those into like, I'm returning string code fragments. And you're like, oh, man, okay, what in the, what in the world is, is, is that going about? And what, 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 is doing, what is he doing here? Um, so what I'm going to do is, is basically take like all those, like all those code, I have these functions that return like, like code fragments, just to sort of, to sort of see what's going to happen here. Let me, let me just run that kind of in its partial state here. Um, essentially what, what happens is if you take descriptor and you call um, set code on it, you get like a, like a fragment of code and then if you, uh, if you do um, like typed set code or, or like integer set code, let's just do that, um, you get a little fragment of code like that. So every, every single one of these is, is basically produces like a, like a little code fragment. You could say, okay, well, what in the world, what, what would you do with that? Well, what you could do is you could say, well, let's, let's, make, a, um, let's make some code that basically starts out like this. You could say, well, let's define a set method, self instance value, colon, like that. And then what you could do is you could say uh, for class in uh, like positive integer, dot MRO uh, for line in class set code
code append. Uh, I got to add like an indentation to it. That, that's kind of why I added that uh, thing like that. Um, Uh, what did I? Uh, oh, because it goes all the way back up to the object. Did I? Uh, I must be missing something somewhere. Uh, I check to see that there's a set yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you get the idea. Let, let, let me see here. For line and class, that. Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. <coughs> it failed, but we got the code anyway. Okay, so. You know, <laughs> so. Um, yeah. Okay. Well. Okay. So you. Yeah. You. You, you get the idea here. Okay. So what. What. We're, what we're. Gonna, what we're going to do here, is. Is we'll. We'll. We'll basically join all that code together. And you have this. Now I, I kind of screwed it. There, there's a few things that are a little bit wonky here that I'm going to fix in a second. But you kind of get the idea where this thing is going. It's like. Mm, okay. He's going to. Basically going to walk the MRO, and I'm going to like. Add. I'm basically going to concat a whole bunch of code together. And you're, you're saying, oh, this is so wrong, so 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 level here. So, um, so let me. I think I have the code for this. So let me uh, pull this pull this in here. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do is basically write like a little utility function that sort of says, okay, make setter. Okay. So this thing is going to is, is going to make that set function. The only thing that's a little bit different about this one is that um, I actually only use do it if it's actually literally in the class dictionary. This actually avoids some of the, repet like the repetition, like getting it more than once. So, so it's gonna go through there, make, make a whole bunch of code. Yeah, the flames are getting really, really hot now. Okay, so we're, gonna, we're, 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 we're basically doing these set code methods. And then we're gonna um, have all the descriptors kind of, kind of go through there, combine all that code. And you're saying, hmm, okay, that's, that, that's, that's kind of interesting. We have the, have the setter function there. Um, but then we, gotta, we have to figure out some way to get this to work kind of in a nice, a nice way. Okay, so this, this is what it's doing, basically making the, making the set function. And then, um, I don't know, anybody care to guess what is needed at this point? What? Yeah, you need the exec and other stuff. Um, yeah, what you really need here is actually another meta class. Um, turns out you need a you need a meta class for your descriptors now. Okay, so you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna say, oh, okay, we're gonna make a meta class type. Um, it's just uh, let's do something like this. So um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna basically define this using an init function. You're gonna say, okay, how is this gonna work? Well, I'm gonna, ba basically this init is going to create the class. Okay, so let's, uh, let's just um, create the class first. And then what I'm gonna do is um, execute that like, set code thing. So what I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make, like the code is gonna be equal to, um, you know, make setter of myself, okay, keep in mind with a meta class, it's like you're talking about the class. So this is, this is gonna make the, the, basically make the set code. And then I'm, I'm just going to execute the code. Yeah, I'm gonna execute the code um, basically in the class. I'll do it in the class dictionary at this point. So, um, so, we'll, so we'll execute it in the dictionary. And uh, well, let's just see what happens. Let's, let's just see what happens with that. Actually, one thing that I know you have to do here. Um, is, is copy this over. This is kind of a weird technicality, but um, it turns out that this class dictionary it passed at this point is not the actual one being used by the class. I used it to, for the convenience of using the exec, but you, you, you do that. So, so this, this thing. It's gonna, it's like, hmm, okay, what in the world is going on with that? This is, gonna, this is basically gonna kind of gonna execute those set code methods for me and then produce, produce a set function. There's so many things that are so wrong about, about this, at this at this point, but that's, that's, that's what we're doing there. Um, one little quiz question about this, uh, this, this is for the experts, um, why is this being done in the init function of a meta class as opposed to the new function of a meta class? 
Yeah, uh, it was partly like to create the class. Um, I have to do it there because the generation of the code actually requires the MRO to be established. And I can't do that if the class hasn't been created yet. That's one, of, that's, that's, that's one subtlety of that. So, uh, okay, so we're, we're, we're going to do that. I don't know, let's just try it and see what happens. Okay, so this thing, uh, j just to be clear about, about what is going on, um, set attribute, got a little typo there. Um, set, oh, set attribute on myself here, okay, that's. Uh, where, okay, can you repeat the question? Here, let me. Uh, uh, Oh, why am I doing this? It turns out that when you create a class, uh, Python often will um, copy the class dictionary into its own thing. I mean, it's sort of a, it's, it's, it's sort of a subtle feature, but if you, if you look at it like a typical class definition, you know, like stock, you know, underscore, you know, there's your, your class. If you look at the underlying dictionary, it tends to kind of get wrapped up with some extra stuff. Like, I mean, you, you sort of see like, oh, it's a mapping proxy. It's like, oh, okay, it's not really, a, you know, it's like a mapping proxy object. You'll actually find that it's a read-only dictionary. Like you can't put anything into it. You get like a type error. For various reasons, like when the class gets created, you, you know, that the dictionary that you initially received in a meta class is not necessarily the one that's being used for the class. And so that, that's actually what's going on there. It's... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm using the dictionary that got passed in just to do the exec, mainly because I, I guess I'm being lazy. It's like, well, I already have a dictionary there, so I'll just use it. I use it to make the set function. So uh, that, that is a little bit of a weird thing. It's like, hmm, I'm execing this thing, but then I gotta copy it over, okay? I'll, I'll just put a note, you know, yes, this is uh, weird. Okay, so, um, yeah, so that's, uh, that, 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 that's, that's what's going on there. Um, now, it, you know, so what's going to happen with this, okay, so, so assuming that this, is, that this worked, and I'm not sure that it, that it did, but we'll, we'll find out, is um, you should be able to do the, the different sets. You know, it's, it's like, it's, it's basically still working, but it's generating the code kind of on, on, on the fly there. Very, uh, very scary. Now, one thing you might want to do, this is, this is actually a little bit of a frightening thing. It's like, okay, you're making descriptors, but you're not, you're not using the underscore set method anymore. You're doing like code generation stuff. Uh, one possibility that you might want to account for is whether somebody would define like a traditional descriptor hanging off of that. Like if somebody were to say, well, here's my class, you know, my you know, my descriptor inherits from descriptor. And then for some reason, they didn't know that you were doing this, like, um, this horrible magic, like, like that. Um, let me just put a pass in there. That, that actually might be something that you would want to either shut down or error check for. I mean, and, and you can actually do that. I mean, one of the things that you could do in this descriptor meta class is you, you, could, you could essentially look at it and say, you know what, if... Um, if, if there's some method set in the class dictionary, you know, raise like a type error or something like that, you know. Okay, so, so if, if you had something like that, um, let's see what happens. Um, now you get basically an exception saying, okay, well, you know, this, this, this thing that you've defined is not proper according to what the coding convention is. So th th there, there are different things that you, can, that you can do there. It is a little bit scary um, doing exec though, although since name tuple does it, I'll, I'll, I can get away with it. So, so if, you, if, you make that, if you make that chain, okay, do, do a little meta class stuff. A um, whole bunch of interesting stuff is happening. Just to be clear about it, the user of this has no idea whatsoever that this is going on. I mean, it's like they're using these classes 
Uh, I didn't make any change to the stock class. This is all behind the scenes magic in, in descriptors. Turns out that it really does some nice things with the uh, performance on that. So um, if you see what happens here, it went from like 86 times slower down to 6.7 times slower. About three times faster with attribute assignment. It's basically a pretty big speed up across the board. I mean, one, one of the things that, that, that happened, I mean, you, you, you just eliminated like a whole bunch of machinery. Like you got rid of the super function. You even got rid of function calls. I mean, you're not even, you're not even like, you know, it's just like one function that's just doing the code there. How, how scared are people? There's a question in the back there. Yeah, I, I would do the, the, yeah, the question is, would you do the first method or the second method? I would probably do the first method. The reason I'm kind of doing the second method is just to explore the space of possibilities. I mean, it's, you know, it's like, it's like, wow, there's some really, there's some wild things that you can do. Um, you know, getting into like execing code and like having meta classes like form code fragments and, and do all sorts of other uh, sort of crazy stuff, yeah. I hope that this remains a theoretical question, but could you, could you write a preprocessor that moves meta into exec with some guarantees as to correctness? Yeah, the question is a preprocessor that moves, uh, I don't know. Like, what, oh. Sort of like explicit loop on rolling, right? Oh, like, oh yeah, you like. Write it the dry way and then it actually does it the wet way. You know, actually, yeah, the question is could you, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, could you write code, like the, this is basically the question, could you write code that would take like the normal set functions and then do something with them to combine them. And yeah, I mean, I, I could think of like a few ways to do that, like processing source or maybe processing Python abstract syntax trees. I, I'm curious to see what Mike has to say about this. Try try it in PyPy to do this. Uh, Yeah, just run it on PyPy. Yeah, I didn't look at that. Uh, I don't know. Let's not bring PyPy into this insanity. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 the the in, in, insanity of, of, of all this. It actually brings me to this. Um, okay, so yeah, the horror, the horror. I don't know whether Al, that's Alex Gaynor, who's uh, uh, very dark in that photo. Uh, you can't even see that. So uh, yeah, the horror, the horror. You kind of you kind of look at this and say, well, this is this is insane um it's kind of a you know you, you look at this they're actually you know I'll have some time here one, one of the things you might look at this and say okay um this is just this is just madness you know it's like how would i um there's kind of the kind of the remaining question here is how, how would you convince some manager that this is a good idea i mean it's 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 like so far off the rails at this point that you're know, like hmm and and so the uh answer to that is clearly XML. Um, yeah. Um, so um, yeah. So we're gonna do. Uh, th 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 this is gonna like push it over the you know the edge here. So what what, what I've got here is um, this. This actually might answer your question about generating code on the, on the fly here. So um, so let's say we had like an XML uh, representation of the uh, the data here. I will note, by the way, that this is XML that additionally includes a regex. So that's, it's, it's, it's like a bonus feature, regex and XML. Okay, so, uh, so you, have, uh, you, have, you have XML. Yeah, five, five extra credit points there. Uh, so so like what, what in the world would you do with, with that? Uh, okay, let's, let's kind of work through this here. Okay, so... Um, Let's say I wanted to turn XML code into Python code, into structure code. So, so to do that, I'm, 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 I'm going to yeah. Okay. Let, let, let's come down here and add some more, add some more code to this. So, so the idea here, okay, this is our this is our XML parsing stuff. If you want to parse XML, 
I just use like the element tree module. That's a, that's a pretty, pretty easy way to do that. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to write is basically um, maybe a function that's like XML to, um, I don't know, like code or something like that. Okay, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have this take uh, maybe a, a file name as, as input. And it's, and it's kind of like, okay, well, how do you parse, how do you parse XML? Well, I'll do a, a parse on that. And then I think the way that this XML is structured, let me just, let me just look at my notes to make sure I'm not completely off the, um, off the uh, deep end with the, uh, the thing here. Okay, so, um, so the, the XML that I'm showing there, I basically have these like, um, like these structure elements there. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk through this, this, um, this XML document making code, um, and maybe what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna call a function like, you know, code is equal to, uh, or, or like class code is equal to XML, well, maybe struct to class or something. I'm gonna start off with some code here. And then um, I'll, I'll just kind of build it up. Code. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of take this in, in little pieces here. Okay, so what this, what this is doing is this is, is parsing a file name. It's gonna walk through that, finding all the structures, and then it's gonna try to like build up kind of like a, like a code fragment from that. I'm gonna write another utility function here, like struct to class where you give it like a, like a structure element and then it's gonna pull some things out of that. Like, uh, let, me, let me look at the schema here. Okay, so like the name attribute. Let, let, let's just start with that. I'll say structure.get name and then I'll, I'll form some code here basically saying, okay, this is gonna be something called class with the name. Inherits from structure and I don't know, let, let's, let's just return that to start here. Okay, so, um, so, so this, 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 I'll build this up here. Okay, so, so we're gonna start with that. And I, this, this is this XML file that, um, that I'm working here. Well, actually, I don't wanna copy that in there. Okay, so. Okay, so here, here's, here's what the XML file looks like. It looks something like that. Uh, I'm gonna write a little bit of parsing, parsing code in here. Okay, let, let, let's just kind of play with it, build, build it up a little bit here, okay. So, so what, I, what I have is essentially, I should be able to say code, you know, XML to code. Let, let's see what we're getting, okay. Well, we're starting to basically make classes. I screwed up my formatting, but you know, there, we, there's other stuff that we, that we need to do there. So, so we're gonna start building up code from, from XML, from, from the name there. Um, then what, we're, what, what we'll do here is basically do some more parsing to pull the, the fields off. So, so it, it, it turns out that in this, if we go back to this XML file, we've got all these like little field elements in there. So what I'm gonna use is use those to generate more code. So I'm gonna say for field, in structure find all field. And then I'm gonna start pulling some things off of this. So, uh, so let's look at the XML. Um, one of the things that's here is there's basically like a type attribute. That's basically the name of the descriptor. It's sort of saying, okay, there's sized regex strings, like pos integer, pos float. So, uh, so let, let, let's, let's sort of pull that off. So we'll say, okay, well the, the data type is gonna be field get type. Okay, and then let's, then let's look at what, what else is there. Um, oh, actually, it's wrong, wrong window there. So then we, then we have some other, um, other fields. There's some optional, like, like optional arguments there. All right, okay, so let, let, let's, let's try to pull some of this off. So the, um, the, the I'll say options is equal to, um, well, I, I'll say value for key value in, field items. This is a little bit of XML parsing, but what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm, I'm essentially saying, okay, give me all the, the things that are not the type. The type is kind of extra there. Okay, so this is, uh, yeah. 
Oh, I also have a space in the quotes, yeah. That would be kind of cool if it was space insensitive, though, you know. Yeah, same, 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 yeah. Okay, so, uh, okay, so we're, we're going to pull off the options there. Um, the name of the thing is going to be, I believe it's just the, the text attribute of field. Maybe we ought to strip it just to be careful there. And then, um, and then, and then what we could do is we could say, okay, well, let, let's add to this code a whole bunch, you know, like some big hack weird thing here. Okay, so there's going to be the type, and then there's going to be the, the keyword arguments. And then, and then the, it's going to look something like that. Name is equal to type with, with some args. So we're going to have the name. We're going to have the, uh, the data type. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some horrible thing with the uh, options there. Okay, so, uh, so, so, so we're kind of building this thing up. Let's, let's just try it out and see what, see what happens here. Okay, so... Um, Okay, it's, it's, it's looking a little bit promising. I'm missing, I think I'm missing a new line in there somewhere, but you can sort of see, uh, okay, it's saying, okay, stock structure, sized regex, um, it's got the, got the different values in there. Okay, so, so it, 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 hopefully you sort of see what's, what's going on here. I'm, I'm basically turning this XML into a Python class definition. There is a method to this madness, by the way, I'll get to in a second here. So, um, Okay, so this this is this is what's happening there. It's a, it's like hmm, okay, we're uh, building up class definitions. These are the same class of definitions that I was working with uh, working with before. I do see one little problem um, in the in the way that I've written that. I did not include the keywords with the uh, with that. So uh, let let me uh, let me see if I can fix that. Actually, actually, one of the things we could do here is actually just make a string that just said. Uh, Like that, so let's let, let's 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 try that. Okay, that's, that, that's looking a little bit better. Okay, we got got keyword arguments there. Okay, so we're we're, we're building up some building up some code. Still a little uh, little scary there. Is uh, everyone good with that? Now, one of the things that we don't have in this code. Uh, if this is code that's going to exec in some way, we do need to bring in the definitions of like structure and all these descriptors and uh, things like that. I don't really know like how you want to how you want to do that. Um, I guess I could put a uh, I guess I could put a method or add just an import statement to uh, to this code. Maybe I'll, uh, since we're already going for broke here, it's. Uh, yeah, I don't know why not. Okay, so yeah, use use the import star just to make it for even worse than it already was. Okay, so um, so you could you, you could you could do that, and you'd basically have um, you know your code is equal to XML code data defs dot XML. There's your code. Okay, from exactly import star, and then got this this like these code fragments. In theory. I should be able to exec that, right? I mean, I should be able to do exec code um, and have that work. Now, the question is, why is it not? Uh, did I change the name of positive? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that's the whole reason for doing XML, though, right? So it's uh, <laughs> you, can, you, you can change the name of things without having to change the code, right? That's the. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so so bad. Okay. Uh, you could tell your manager that. Yeah. Okay. You could you could change the code without changing the code there. Okay. Very good. Okay. You have the exact function. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's, it's this is going so bad. Okay. So. Um, okay. So we're, we're we're turning XML into code now. It turns out that this is this is leading up to like. Something else, okay? It's like, okay, we're making, we're making, turning XML into these like code fragments. But you look at this, it's like this is so stupid. Like, why would you do this? Um, 
Well, the reason you might do this is that you would actually really want to make this work with the import statement. That's, that's what we're really uh, going for here. Um, you know, what would be really cool, this, this is the thing that would be really cool, is if you could just say, you know what, why can't we just say import like data dash? Never mind the fact that it's an XML file. I mean, okay, so data dafts is, is basically that. Uh, couldn't we just like hack the import statement to, um, uh, to do this? So the um, answer is that, is, is that yes. You know, why not? You know, why, why, why not do that? Okay, so uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about um, import hooks. Um, how many of you have ever looked at the value of sys.metapath or even know that it exists? You probably know that there's sys.path. That's, that's the directory of like things that get checked when you load modules. But there's this other thing in there, um, sys.metapath. And you look on there and it's like, hmm, built-in importer, frozen lib importer, find pathfinder, things like that. Um, it turns out that this is a list of classes that get triggered to process the import statement. So, um, well, I don't know, why don't, why don't we just do a little example here. The, the, so what you can do is you can make a class called MyFinder. It actually doesn't matter what it's called, but uh, you, you, you make a class and you can put a method on there, FindModule, where you say, okay, well, you, where you get like a full name here. It turns out that full name is the name of what's being imported. And path is basically the path setting for packages, actually. So that's a subtlety there. Let me just, let me just do a printout of what's going on here. Okay, I'm going to print these out. Full name path. And I'm actually just going to return none because um, I don't know what to do yet. Okay, so, so let's, let's say you made a class like that. And then let's say you decided to um, insert that onto... Um, onto the sys.metapath thing. Okay, so let's say you came in here and you did, you did something like that. Um, if this works, you're gonna start seeing print statements. I just printed out, it said math none there. We should bring threads into this. Okay, you kind of sort of see what's going on here. It's like, hmm. Okay, just I'm intercepting the, I'm intercepting the import statement. Everyone kind of uh, kind of see that? All right. So what could you do with that? Okay. So, um, like, hmm. So maybe I could come back to my exactly thing here. I, I, actually, I'm going to change the name of it to importly because yes. we're doing import here. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's do imports here. So you could um, basically come into this code and say, you know what, I, I'm going to make like a, uh, like, a, like a special like struct import finder or something like that. So I'm going to make a, a finder class that just implements this find module thing along with, with path here. And then you, you could say, well, okay, how is this supposed to work? Um, Okay, so, so what we're gonna what we're gonna do here here's the theory of operation here. Okay, um, make it import somehow. I haven't actually have told you how to do that yet, but um, so th this this is sort of the the theory of operation. So a couple of different ways that you could uh, you could approach this. Um, one way that you could do it is you could start you could you could essentially walk. Um, down system path, well, let me bring in OS module here, and then you could do um, like some file name things where you could say, okay, like the, uh, the file name is gonna be OS path join um, dir name along with the full name of the module plus like dot XML or something. It's maybe not the most, ine most efficient way of doing that, but what, what you're doing there is you're just saying, okay, I'm gonna, I make some file name there, and then and then if the if that um, exists, 
we're gonna we're gonna load XML. Let me just uh, put like a I'm gonna put a print statement in here just so you can see it fire. Um, for the purposes, since I haven't no, I don't know how to implement the next part of it yet. I'm just gonna. Do I have a hanging backslash? Uh, no, I think that's an Emacs rendering thing there. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so let's 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 do that, and then and then I'm gonna I'm gonna put like a little hack in here, like install importer. That's going to. Um, just append this like struct importer thing on here, or struct finder, okay. All right, uh, okay, let's, let's, let's see what happens with that. Okay, so uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna do this importly, uh, that pi here. So if, if that works, first of all, I haven't installed it, so if I do import data defs, it's, can't find it, but what, what, let's 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 do um, let's do the import the install importer. Well, by doing that, um, we should see our thing kind of sitting there. Okay, so it's like hmm, okay, struct finder sitting on the end, and um, if we import data defs, it uh, yeah, it printed it out. It it it, it basically didn't find it because I haven't told it how to find it yet. But it, you see this here. It says. If you look carefully, it says loading XML data defs dot, dot XML. Okay, so it did find a file name match. And you're like, hmm, okay. Uh, I, I didn't hear the question very well. Can you repeat the question? Yes. No, I wrote, I wrote that actually. So um, install importer was just a, yeah, the question is did I write install importer on the, yeah, that's, that, that, that's something that I just wrote to append something onto the, uh, onto that meta path there. Yeah, I'm actually a little bit curious. How many, how many people have ever, how many people have seen this meta path thing before? Just so you know, this is in Python 2.6 too. Uh, and uh, possibly in 2, I'm not sure about 2.5, but it's definitely in 2, is it in, is it in 2.5? It's been there for a while. Um, yeah, that's, I, I think, you know, there, there have been like custom importers around for a while. I think, I think some of the tools that use those are some of these like freezing tools or you can like, yeah, freezing tools, are there? Yeah, encrypted source code. Yeah, question over there. So, for your custom fake importing thing, why does that have to be added to MetaPath as an object or like an instance of that class, but everything else in MetaPath is just a class? Oh, I think the. Um oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. Um, they, they, they might be implementing it as a class method, maybe. That, 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 that's actually a good option. Yeah, the question is why is everything here a class and not an instance of, of a class? Um, I guess I didn't really notice that before. I guess you could go that route if you were to declare find module as a class method. Maybe, there's, maybe if you don't have any like instance state or something, you, don't, you could do that. Let me, let me just try that and see if that, 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 see if that works. Yeah, it still works. I mean, they, they've probably defined that as a class method of some kind. I, I, I actually, I have to admit, I never noticed that before. So, I just, I just know that um, whatever is in the meta, in the meta path has to support a find module method, whatever it happens to be. So, whatever, whatever uh, thing is in there. Now, there was a question over here too. Maybe that answered the the question there. Okay. Now. It turns out that we're still not still not done with this thing. Um, okay, so so this 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 path exists thing. It's like okay, loading XML. That, that the question that comes up now is 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 like now what? Okay, so so what do we do here? Um, it turns out to, that to get the the module to load, we actually have to return something else. Um, we have to basically return like a like a loader object, and this is actually something 
that I'm going to have to write myself. So, um, so what I'm, what I'm going to do here is, is basically return a, uh, you know, a quote loader. And what that class is, is, is going to look like this. It basically has to have a method on there. I believe it's just load module. And I might take the path to, I, I, I'll have to double check this in a second. So I'm going to have this take a file name value just because I located the file name. So I might as well just pass that along there. Okay, so we're going to put a we're going to put a load this like load module thing in there. I'm going to take a quick look at my notes just to make sure I'm not going completely off the rails here. Okay, so okay, so actually you just need the full name, full name of the module. Okay, so you're going to put this 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 load this load module um, load module thing in here. Now what you have to do at this point is actually carry out the import. Okay, so this is so th this is what, what what we have to do here is, is basically carry out the um, the import steps. And you could say, well, how do you, how do you carry out an import? Um, so there's a number, number of things that you have to do here. So what do you have to do with module importing? Well, first of all, um, modules in Python are basically their own objects. Like, you know, it says module math, or if you import URL lib or something like that, and, and, and look at these things. They're basically um, like a module instance. There's like an instance of a module that you make. It turns out that there's a library. You can import the imp library, and you can make modules with that. I believe you can, I, I, is it, uh, yeah, let, me, let me see what it is here. It's, um, yeah, new, new module. I mean, you basically say, okay, make a new module called foo. You have a module object. Now, there's not a whole lot interesting in that at this point. It just sort of has like a name and nothing, nothing else. But you can, you can sort of make a module come into existence. Okay, so that's what, we're, that's what we can do here. We can say, okay, well, let's, uh, we're going to make like the mod is equal to imp new module full name. Okay, so we're going to make the new module. Now, Module imports actually do more than just make the module. Um, one of the things that you have to worry about is there's also this sys modules cache that you might, uh, that you might know about. Uh, so sys.modules is basically a cache of all the currently loaded modules in the system. In order to, to do an import, you actually have to maintain that cache if you want to. I mean, it's, it's, it, you, couldn't, you, could, you could not if you chose not to, but generally, generally you do. So what, what you're going to do is you're going to make a module and then what you have to do b basically at this point is insert it into the, um, into the, the, the module path. Now, now, it, now it turns out that there is sort of a weird technicality here that if the module already exists in the module cache, you're supposed to reuse it. I mean this is all this like, you know, like module reloading, using the same module, that sort of uh, that sort of stuff. So there's, the, you, you basically have to um, do some things here. So, so let me, uh, let me import sys here. So what we're going to do is sys dot um, modules full name uh, equals mod. Maybe uh, maybe if the if the uh, full name is already in. Uh, So we're, we're having to kind of reorganize this a little bit. This is, this is some, uh, bas basically we're creating the module and then we're putting it in sys.modules. Okay, so this is, this is some, some basic background stuff. Um, then what we, what we have to do um, once, once we bring the module in is we need to set a few parameters. Uh, one, one of the things that we need to do is, is basically set the file parameter of where this thing came from. Another thing that you need to do is set like what loader is used to, um, to make this thing. So you're going you're, you're gonna to set up some, some things like this and then return the module back. Okay, so, so this, this is what's going to happen in this, this load module thing. So let me, let, me, let me actually try this real quick, real, real quick without doing much of anything yet. Okay, so, so, so we're going we're, we're gonna to write this loader that's basically making a module. Okay, install importer. I'm going to do import data devs. 
It comes up and says, okay, loaded, it says loading XML. I actually have not done anything with it yet, but what it's gonna do is it's gonna say, okay, data defs is some module, and it comes up and says, oh, it's from the file data defs.xml. This is probably the worst nightmare that you would ever have, right? You know, it's like you're looking at, a, you're looking at your Python code and it's telling you that the source code for your module is an XML file. That's uh, like, hmm, okay. So, uh, so, so you have that. Now, to, to make the rest of it work, you're saying, okay, what, what do you need to do here? Well, to, um, to make the rest of it work, you're gonna use that, that XML stuff. You're gonna say, okay, XML to code, file name. That's, that's, that's essentially using this thing that we just did up here, the XML parser. So we're gonna, we're gonna read that code and parse it and turn it into a code fragment. And then what do you do with that? Well, you just exec it in the module dictionary. Okay, the flames are getting really hot now. Okay, so, uh, so this is, this is it's, you know, it's basically you're hooking into the import statement, parsing XML, making code, bringing it in. If this, if this works, I'm not sure it will, but uh, if, you, if you do this, so we should be able to say install importer. And then we should be able to say import data dash. Bring us into the loading message. Should be able to do a, uh, a dir on it. Now, because I did the from import star, I'm in like kind of in a tough spot here, but it's like you see stock and, and some other things in there. I should just be able to do uh, data defs dot stock. Okay, so. Um, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so you've, you've sort of so, so now what you've got. Okay. And again, the uh, the the source. You know, your data defs. That's in the uh, data defs .xml file there. Um, so many things wrong with this on so 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 many levels. There. What? Try to. Can you repeat that again? Yeah, so the question is, could I, um, if I understand it, could I redo the example in the test-driven development style? <laughs> the answer is no, obviously. Okay, so, um, all right, so a whole, <laughs> whole bunch of stuff here. You're like, oh, my, oh man. Okay, so we're basically hooking into this, like, this, this structure importing uh, machinery. Um, one, one, one little thing about some of this import hook stuff is um, Python 3.3 really builds that out in a big way. I mean, actually, one of the big changes in Python 3 is that um, the entire import machinery for Python itself has been implemented in Python using the import hook machinery. And, because, and, 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 and that's actually a big difference between like Python 2 and Python, th like 3.2, even 3.2 and 3.3. Like, like if you um, look at this meta path, you see things like, oh, it's frozen, you know, built-in importer, frozen importer, pathfinder, and so forth. If you switch Python versions, like, you know, you just go to Python 2.7 or something, and you look at that, at that meta path, it's just empty. Now, the reason it's empty is that the import for in Python 2.7 is implemented in C. I mean, it's like it's C code somewhere deep in the interpreter. It's like it's not exposed to you. And the same thing even in, in, in like Python, oh, I don't have Python 3.2. Yeah, it's, it's also empty in 3.2. I guess Python 3.2 is dead to me at this point. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's, 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 that's, that's actually one of the big changes in Python 3.3 is that they have exposed this, uh, this import machinery uh, uh, to you. I mean, it, 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 you know, honestly, I, I, I don't know how you feel about the import statement. I think it's actually one of the most mysterious black voodoo art things in Python. I mean, it's like, I, I mean... I, I just look at it and it's like, how in the world do imports work? I mean, it's, actually, I think Brett is somebody, somebody, I think one of the core developers is giving like a talk at the conference about how does the import statement work. And he, he showed me some part of it at, at one point. It was like this huge diagram of all these arrows and like font so small that I had to like blow it up bigger to sort of uh, see what's going on. But the, yeah, the import statement, very, very mysterious. And that's actually one of the, the big changes in this Python 3. <coughs> 
is um, basically basically exposing the import machinery in a more coherent way. I mean, this is documented better. There's like more of a precise procedure that these things are supposed to follow. Um, there's there's different things that you can uh, that you can do with it. Did some experimentation over the summer of importing LLVM bit code directly into Python using import hooks. And it was like that that's kind of its own scary little little project there. But if you convince yourself it was a good idea, you could directly import, say, a SQLite file and have the ORM all set up for you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, is Peter Wang here actually? I don't know. I don't, he, he pulled me, uh, so Peter is one of the continuum analytic guys. I think he pulled me aside at some conference last year and he was exploring some idea of using import hooks to directly embed SQL right into the middle of Python source. Like, I don't know exactly the detail of that, but it was kind of the idea is, you know, you could have like source code that would just suddenly switch context to do SQL and he was doing some crazy import source parsing, uh, some, some source parsing thing. I don't know really what happened with that, but. I was sort of horrified at the time, and uh, and and so forth. So so um, so 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 what we've got here, basically importing in, importing modules from XML with regex in there, and meta classes and and, and all sorts of other stuff. Um, I think if you uh, yeah, I don't know whether the the import yeah if you do the get source on this stuff, it actually might show you the XML. Let me let me actually try that. Um, The inspect module, by the way, the, uh, yeah, okay, so, um, yeah, yeah, very, very, what's, what's not to love about that, okay, so, 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 so some final thoughts on some of this stuff, we're gonna have some, a uh, fair amount of time for, for questions on, on some of this, so, uh, actually, that says airstrike on it, I don't know, it's a little bit dark for some reason, um, there's a lot of very powerful things you can do with some of this metaprogramming stuff. Um, I think if there's takeaway, I mean, you can, you, you can have like descriptors as building blocks, uh, you know, hiding a lot of annoying details, code generation, hooking into import, um, all, sorts of, um, all sorts of interesting things. And one, one thing you, can, you could, I mean, think about with this is, you know, is, is, this, is this tutorial, is it just one gigantic hack or is Python 3 designed to do this stuff? And I, I would actually make the claim that Python 3 is actually, they're actually thinking about this kind of stuff to make it work nicely. I mean, there's, there's um, a lot of this like advanced meta class stuff with the prepare method, you have signatures, you have input ho import hooks, some of the keyword only arguments. I mean, even though we did some kind of crazy, you know, some crazy things in this tutorial, I don't think I actually did any like just completely mind boggling weird hack to work around some language limitation. You know, like, you know, to, you know, it's saying, well, I have to do this weird hack because Python's broken in this way and I, you know, I, gotta, I have to do this workaround. I didn't, at least in my mind, I did not do any what I would call workaround in here for stuff. I mean, they're, they're, admittedly, you know, there's some advanced things, but there's, you know, a bunch, bunch of very interesting stuff. Um, I think there's a lot of um, little things in Python, or at least Python 3, that just become easier. I mean, there's, there's like tons and tons of like little subtle stuff like that, like the keyword only arguments. You could say that's such a minor feature, but yet it opens up like all sorts of interesting things like, you know, mixing keyword arguments with star args and like composition of functions and things. I mean, it's a little, a little weird. There's, there's even a lot of like little things that are just really nice about Python 3, like, like the fact that the compare operator works. It's not a metaprogramming technique, but I mean, I don't know whether you, I mean, hopefully you know this, but, but compare doesn't work in Python 2. Well, it works, but it works all the time for everything. So there's, there's it, you know, it, it, it's a lot of stuff like that. A lot of little, little things in, in Python 3 that just sort of come together and make things interesting. Now, now it turns out that, that we've only sort of scratched like the surface of what is possible. Um, one thing that I didn't talk about at all are things like function annotations. You know, it's like, okay, if you've never, if you haven't seen function annotations before, I mean, essentially, essentially what you can do is you could have a, um, let's go back to Python 3 here, you could have a function where you say, okay, this is the add function, but then you could like attach things to it. 
like that. And you, could, and you can say, well, what does that do? It doesn't do anything. Python attaches no meaning to that at all. But what happens is they're, um, they're basically stored just in a, in a dictionary. You get this sort of annotations table, and it just tells you what the annotations are. Turns out that those annotations can actually be anything whatsoever. I mean, they could be like a number, or they could be a string. It could be a lambda function, why not, you know, okay. So, um, yeah, the, 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 like permanent job security there. Okay, so, um, yeah, all right. So, uh, but, it, but it basically just stores that, and you can say, well, what's the, you know, like, what's the purpose of that? What's the purpose of annotations? It's, I don't know. I mean, you could do some pretty wild things combining that with things like meta classy. <laughs> I mean, why you, you you could do things like this? I mean, you could say, well, let's let's have like some class, you know, you know, class spam, and then we'll start doing things like well, let's have a bar method that takes like an int, and let's have another bar method that takes like a like a string. And you could say you could say, well, how like, you might look at that and say, well, okay, that's, you know, that's clearly so wrong. I mean, I could capture that kind of stuff. You could say, well, how would you capture that? I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things you could do with it. I could basically make a class that would inherit from, like, dictionary, for instance. I could say, well, let's, let's, let's inherit from dictionary, redefine the set item method to, um, to name, and then I'll just look it up. It's like, if, if the name is, is in myself, And then, uh, so yeah, if the name is in my, yeah, I have, to, I have to think about this. Okay, so I'm gonna look up, basically look it up, say if I, if I already have the name in myself, then what I'm gonna do is, is basically pull out the value. So I'm gonna say, okay, let's, pu let's pull out the value here. Pulling it out, if it's not a list, I'm gonna turn it into a list, and then I'm just gonna append. Uh, actually, you know, I've screwed this up because I don't have the value there. Okay, so, um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to fix this in a second here. Okay, so, let, let me fix this real quick. So, um, p hopefully people see what I screwed up there. It's, uh, I, forgot, I forgot to put in the value there, so. Yeah, I've got this. I've got this completely mad. I think we're doing okay on time, though. So, hey, what? <laughs> Val is the thing that was being pulled out there. It's uh, you know, it's not good style here, but. Uh, Okay, so, so I, might, I, might, I might be able to do something like that, and then I, and then I could say, well, okay, I'm going to make like a, you know, like a meta class that has that uh, prepare method on there. Actually, I believe it just takes like the uh, class name. No, let, let, let's just try that and see, see what happens. Um, and, then, and then what you could do is, you know, you could say things like, okay, well, this is my class spam or meta, meta class. You, 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 you're sort of getting an idea of how, what, what sort of horrible evil would be, would be possible here, where it's like you're, you're going to have a bar method where x is int. Let's just, let's just see what happens there. Okay, well... Yeah, I, oh, I, I blew it. Okay, well, and I, I don't know whether I'm gonna like keep hacking on that, but you get the idea where it's like, hmm, you could, you could like start collecting all these methods basically into a list. And then you could have like some meta class basically like pulling those together and like doing like multiple dispatch or overloading or something like that. I don't know whether I would recommend that. I'd probably not <laughs> recommend that. Uh, I mean, I've actually kind of experimented with that and it's, it's too, it, it's almost too weird to work with. But, but, th but that is sort of uncharted territory with, with annotations. I'm actually, uh, uh, I'm actually sort of wondering whether function annotations 
are almost like an aborted idea in the Python world. I, 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 does anybody know, is anybody using them for anything? It's Yeah, the question, yeah, it's a normal way. I, I think my, my fear, yeah, my fear with the, the annotation stuff is that they don't compose well between, like, libraries. Like, if, if you're using some code that uses annotations for some purpose, you can't mix it with any other library that uses annotations for a different purpose. Because there's no way to have, like, multiple annotations on there in, a, in an easy way. And, it's, it, 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 and, and I think that's definitely a problem. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, co the comment is, you know, maybe for um, like like designed by contract stuff, you could do annotations. I don't, I don't know though, because I think why could, couldn't you do, um, couldn't you do like a decorator, like 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 this? Couldn't you do like type? Couldn't you do something like type assert int int? Def add like x y like like that. I mean, it's a slightly different formulation of it, but I think most of the uses of like I, actually, I think almost all the uses of function annotations could probably be replaced by decorators. You know, if you in, if you were concerned about like kind of composing them and stuff. Well, function annotations were explicitly put in without a <laughs> Yeah, the comment is they were put in without a purpose. I would actually slightly disagree with that. Um, it turns out this, this is a bit of history. I've been going to Python conferences for a while, and um, I know uh, sort of around like I'd say like 1999, maybe around 2000, there was actually a, kind of an interest in the Python world about the concept of optional static typing. There's a whole bunch of ideas sort of thrown around. The idea was, I wonder if we could put like optional static types into the language somehow. Maybe, maybe like, like this. And then if you had that, could you do type inference across your source code? Like you, could you take the, op like this, the, the, the static types and then propagate them through the source code and do maybe some optimization from it or, or things like that? So th there, there was actually some active discussion about that in the Python world. Like could you have optional static types? It was kind of never really resolved because if you're doing type inference, one of the, one of the, th the things that's tricky about that is it tends to be like a virus in your in your program, right? It starts all these th these types like type to start to propagate, and it was never clear how you were going to get this like optional thing to work. Let's like, you know, so are you going to have like optionally typed stuff mixing with partially typed things? And I, I just I just don't think it went I don't think it went very far. And, I, and actually, I th you know, my impression is that some of the things like PyPy ended up going in a different direction. You know, it's like PyPy is you know looking at you know doing like just in time compilation. They're analyzing your code. To make it run fast, but they're not—they're not doing it through, like this idea of having an explicit specifier saying the type. So I don't know. I think that's where it came from. Honest, honestly, is that? Do you have a thought on that, Mike? I have a question about this one. You use two bar methods, but the, the method names are for the dictionary. They're never going to survive. And the last one. Oh, the thing that I was trying to do here—I kind of screwed it up—is that um, I was actually trying to substitute my own dictionary under the covers where the set item method would basically check to see whether something was already defined. Yeah, I mean, what I was trying to do is basically um, collect all the duplicate definitions into a list. And then, and then what I would end up doing with that list or something afterwards is basically processing it through a meta class or something. I would, have, I would have some piece of the code that would look at that and say, oh, there's multiple definitions for this. And that would stop the second death from cleaning yeah, right, right. Just the fact that you're collecting them would, right, right. So, so yeah, the other, there are some, there are some, some interesting things there. Um, some other, some other uncharted uh, territory um, things are, are, are the use of non-local variables in closures and stuff. Um, there's some pretty unusual things with that. Um, actually, Raymond Henninger has this really interesting recipe on the, on the active state site where he, um, 
basically lets you define almost look like, like, like class definitions, but entirely using functions. You actually you make like a, like a function that you have like a, whole, a whole bunch of inner methods and then using non-local variables, it, it sort of creates instances and looks like classes. Very sort of intriguing code. Uh, there's also a, a variety of things like obviously like, like context managers. There's some weird thing. We didn't talk about that. Um, to make the PyPy guys happy, you could, you could start getting into things like frame hacking. That's probably a really bad idea. Uh, there. That basically modifying things like stack frames. Um, some other things are kind of interesting is, is Python has the ability to parse its own source code. I don't know if you've messed around with that, but there's, there's like the AST module where you can, you can write out some code like, you know, let, let, let's say you had some code fragment like that. Um, you could actually um, do like an AST parse on that. Okay, basically parsing that, and it would actually turn into, um, you know, oh, mod I think there's like a uh, AST, like there's a utility method dump that would, that would do that. It will actually, uh, it'll actually take the source code down into sort of like a structure, sort of describing it. You could write tools that go into that and like walk through the source code and do like, like tree rewriting of the source code. You do analysis of the source code. Like one, one potential possibility is you could, like, you could use that. Like here's a, here's, here's a theory. Like I could, like, like in this descriptor code that I did with all the execs, okay, this, 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 this set code thing that I was messing around with here, maybe instead what I could do is take like the AST module, pull off the source code for a properly written set method, go in there, analyze it, maybe find like the super calls and then take them out and then like rewrite the method. I mean, I, I, I don't know, you know, in, in theory it's possible. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah if, if you want to go back, if you want to take an AST and you take it to code, um, you just basically compile it. Oh, you need, a, you know, like a file name, so. And you also need a, it's been a while since you've used the compile function. Okay, so, uh, but yeah, you can just compile like an AST and then take it, take it down. So, variety of sort of uh, crazy things. Now, now, as far as like kind of some final comments, okay, we've done all this sort of nutty uh, stuff, you know, it's like, should you do any of this stuff? Um, I don't think m this metaprogramming stuff is, is what I would s use for like normal coding. I don't know what normal means, but if, I, if I'm just writing some script to pro process a log file or something, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do this. Um, framework code, <laughs> library code, maybe a, maybe a different story. I mean, you're probably using a lot of frameworks already that are doing stuff like this, but you don't, you don't realize it. Um, right now there's a lot of activity, for instance, in like the science community with doing some of this metaprogramming stuff. If you look at, uh, if you look at things like the Numba project, where it's like, you know, you decorate Python functions and it's like turning that into LLVM code, runs super fast. I mean, that, that's some really, really advanced stuff. There's some, some really neat stuff that you, can, that you can do with that. So I think with that, I mean, we're, we're, we're basically out of time. We have like five minutes left. That's, that's essentially the end of it. So um, I, I, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming. I uh, hope you learned a few, uh, few things. Uh, the Python cookbook coming out has all sorts of Python uh, 3 stuff in there. Just a little bit about that book. That's basically, it's a ground up clean rewrite of the Python cookbook going from the perspective of Given a problem, how would you solve it in the most modern way possible in Python 3.3? It has a very interesting sort of spin on it. So look for that in May. And, and that's basically it. I can ask, answer a few more questions if, if, if people have. It's a question there. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think I.
Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So the, the, the comment is about the source code. It, I, I forget the format for that. It's like a, it's like a weird, like, uh, do you remember what it is? There's like a thing you can put in your source code at the top, like a... Yeah, it, it's, it's something sort of like that. Hash? Okay, we, 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 yeah, the, yeah, I know what you're saying. There's basically like this encoding thing that you could like, you can put at the top of like a source file and then. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, so, okay, so yeah, okay, so. Yeah, okay, yeah, uh, custom, uh, Custom encoding, yeah, okay, that's a very diabol, yeah, okay, I can see that. Um, but if, you're, if you're sort of wondering, okay, what is he talking about exactly? Um, you be, essentially, you could put this thing in your source code and have, it, have your file processed through a custom encoder. It's kind of like, I guess you would say it's like source code rewriting through sort of a, a Unicode encoding. Hack. Yeah, I haven't really explored that, but yeah, I could, s okay. Interesting, yeah, comment here. Oh yeah, question, how often does somebody else's meta class code stomp on somebody else's? I don't know whether I have an answer to that, except that I do know that horrible, horrible things happen if you ever mix like multiple classes originating from two different <laughs> meta classes together. Um, you know, like, like I, I, actually I might be able to do that here. Um, like, like if you had like this positive integer class, let me, uh, okay, th this was, uh, uh, positive. Was it pos integer or positive? I think it was positive integer. So let, let's say you had some class like that, and then you decided for some reason that, I don't, do you guys, do you guys know about the ABC module? The like abstract base class module? I mean, you could have, th this is sort of weird uncharted territory here where you could say, well, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have some class that inherits from that. And then what, what, what if for some reason you decided you wanted to inherit from like positive integer and, and A? You, you, uh, you'll start to get like just crazy error messages. I mean, I don't even know whether I fully understand this error <laughs> message. It's like, you know, meta, meta class conflict, you know, derived classes, non-strict thing. It, it, it's kind of like, oh, okay, the, ca the coffee is worn off and I'm just gonna go home. <laughs> At that, at that point, but yeah, I mean that that that's definitely a danger. Like you know, multiple libraries. I don't know whether they mix so well, but Mike has a question. Yeah, you, you showed code there. The beta program makes it much much slower. Do you have examples where actually it's possible? Like if you use decorators, you might move things just in the in the compile step, and then you can uh, like to, and you don't generate like dynamic functions. It's not get faster. Yeah, the question, do I have any examples of making things faster? Not off the top of my head that I would throw in there. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, have to th I have to think about that. So I definitely want to post this, this, the, uh, the other solution with the... Uh, the structure initialization thing too, though. Okay. So um, what's what's neat about the way it did is, is that you could actually just have an option deciding whether to do all the checks or just to compile the code without the checks. So if you're using this like in a web app, sanitize the user input, you need the checks. But if you're just using it in an in-house application, you could run it a few times, and if it works pretty well, then you could disable the checks and get the feedback. Yeah. Yeah, the comment is like if, if, if maybe you could run it with the checks for a while and then take away the checks at some other point. Uh, definitely, I mean, it's, you know, they, they can do, you can do any of that stuff in meta classes, you know, where it's like, you know, optionally turn the stuff off or on. Do it without changing the code, so. And then. So, prepare takes class in the name and basis. Uh, class makes sense. I was struck by the fact that we were just uh, returning vanilla dictionary to one kind or another. Um, do you think of any reason why you'd want to use name and basis in, in the redefined compare? 
Yeah, the question is in, in that prepare method on a meta class, um, would you ever want to use the name and bases? Um, let me see if I, fi if I find that code somewhere. Okay, so um, yeah, here. Yeah, I never, I never ended up using them. Um, I don't know, I'd have to think about that. I mean, maybe you would use that in some way. I mean, one, one thing about the prepare method too is it can actually take extra arguments. You know, like, uh, like you could have like, you know, foo and bar uh, sitting there. Um, if you do that, they actually become like extra arguments that you can use in the class definition. Like you could say meta class equals struct meta foo equals 23 or something, something like that. Um, it, it becomes a little bit tricky to sort of manage that, but yeah, yeah, yeah potentially you could have like, like the prepare takes extra arguments with the intent of doing more control over what, what's happening with class creation and so forth. All right, I think we have time for one more question and then. Uh, all right, that's it. Well, thank you very much and uh, I don't know. <laughs>